So good morning, everyone. On the behalf of organizing committee, I would like to once again welcome you all for the day two of the meeting. We have planned the fellows course today afternoon of four hours duration, extending from 12 noon to 4 p.m. The program includes basic and fundamental of imaging interpretation and functional assessment during PCI. It is nice to see that there is growing incline and interest of budding and young cardiologists in this field of imaging in the last few years. We have chosen the expert in uh, this field to deliver lecture on the various aspects about uh, uh, this selected interventional topic. As it is going to be an interactive session, I would request the fellows to write their comment and queries in the chat box so that the expert faculty member as chairperson and panelists could reply, respond to the queries. At last, I request the chairperson to con kindly consider the time limit when carrying on the various session, including the discussion on the individual topic. With this remark, I now invite the chairperson and panelists for the first session regarding fundamental and principle of imaging and uh, functional assessment. For the first session, the chairperson are Dr. P. K. Goel, Dr. Anurag Sharma, Dr. D. S. Chadda, Dr. G. Tram, and Dr. Parag Barwar. And the panelists include uh, Dr. Lakshmi Khan, Dr. Srinivas Prasad, Dr. Deepa Kapila, Dr. Suresh Patel, and Dr. Anil Krumar. So over to Dr. Goel to go ahead for, please. Yeah, thank you. So I think uh, it's a very, uh, should be an enlightening session, I think. And uh, uh, three cheers to uh, Vijay Vargya to have organized such a meeting. So without wasting much time, I would uh, request the first speaker who is going to speak on the basics of OCT image interpretation by Dr. Nishit Chandra. So Nishit, uh, I think needs no introduction. He's from uh, Fortis Hospital, uh, uh, Delhi. So, Nishit, please, uh, can you go ahead with your presentation? So, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vijayvargia, for including me in this uh, IPCI and Dr. Goel for introducing me. So, for next 15 minutes, I'll be taking you to the journey of uh, optical coherence tomography. What are the basics? I have kept it purposefully very, very simple without including any trials or anything. Uh, it's basically for fellows that how should they incorporate OCT images into their clinical journey and in image interpretation for the betterment of the patient. So the, the, let us see that how the invasive image, imaging developed. So we all uh, do angiography, which started in 1958, but its resolution is uh, less, one mil, almost about one millimeter or uh, 500 micron, up to 500 microns. Be below that, you can't see that. And then 1988 came the sound-based imaging technique, which is intravascular ultrasound with improved resolution up to 100 microns. It means up to 100 microns and above things, you can see, visualize it. But the real game changer was the light-based uh, imaging technology, which is optical coherence tomography, which has uh, basically set the standard so low that you can image up to 10 microns of uh, structures. So you must uh, you know that the macrophages are about 10 to 12 microns, the RBC is about 8 microns. So with this technology, you can even see up to the histological patterns of your structure. So this is such a precise technology. So that is why it is going to stay and it makes it basically opened a new window to our uh, understanding of coronary pathologies, acute coronary syndromes, calcification, and plaque morphologies. So today I'll base my topic on what is the basics of uh, OCT. Unlike ultrasound IVAS, which uses sound, OCT uses light wave. And the key component of image, of OCT image, you have to basically just explain your OCT or interpret your image only in three categories. And these are backscatter, which is just but a reflection of the image, the attenuation, which is absorption, and texture, whether it is homogeneous and heterogeneous. So I will, to simplify it, I will take two identical images to explain each of these categories. What is backscatter, what is attenuation, and what is texture? So coming to the image, 
and you see that on the right there is an image on the left there is an image now back scatter i told you is just nothing but reflection of the signal so the, on the left image you can see the reflection is very very much it is highly back scattering image highly reflective image so this is a high back scatter image usually it occurs in plaques uh, the uh, homogeneous plaques on the contrary on the right you can see that the reflection of signal is not that much it is it is attenuated it is uh, less reflective so this is low back scatter this is what it is a red thrombus so the coming to the ocg image interpretation when you can see that this is a light source that the light source in oct is in the center of the catheter uh, and the light source then emits the uh, light waves and it goes through the sheet and goes to impinges upon the structures and then back scatter occurs these back scatter images are again read by the optical lens and it is interpreted by computer as an image so you can see this is a normal artery and you can see highly back scattering image of a uh, intima which is a hypertrophy it is a fibrous plaque so uh, th this is a highly back scattering image the coming to the uh, next attribute of oct interpretation is attenuation keeping in mind the taking the same two images you can see image on the left is not attenuated the signal can penetrate up to all the way to the deeper layer so this is low attenuating image while in the right image on the right you can see the signal is absorbed it is am the amplitude of signal is reduced as it goes away from the source so this is highly attenuated image so uh, now you have to see where is the attenuation it is in the uh, lumen or it is in the wall if it is in the wall in the same you can see that this is light source and it is the obstructing lesion is of high density so it is attenuating the light uh, images they are not able to penetrate the posterior wall so this is a high attenuating image the uh, for our interpretation the examples are classically it is lipid so high attenuating signal is your enemy wherever there are high attenuating <clears throat> zones you should not land up your proximal or distal uh, stent uh, zones uh, borders <clears throat> so another example of high attenuation i just, uh, showed you in the initial image is of red thrombus so the red thrombus you uh, by oct you can even differentiate between a platelet rich white thrombus and a fibrin rich rbc rich red thrombus the importance is, is in timelining and establishing whether the plaque is vulnerable or not so uh, this is a white thrombus unlike uh, red thrombus where the attenuation is more the right in the white thrombus which is platelet rich you can see that the, it is not attenuating you can the uh, light waves are passing all the way through the back of the thrombus so this is white thrombus which is platelet rich so this is how you differentiate based on the attenuation another thing of attenuation in which is specially relevant to oct is the def definition of the calcium in by oct you can even define the depth of the calcium because the light waves penetrate the calcium and you can see that not only the leading edge but also the trailing edge which in ultrasound and i was you can't because sound waves don't penetrate so you cannot comment upon the thickness of the calcium and this thickness as you know if it is more than 500 microns then this is a calcium which needs to be ab ablated or uh, ivulsed or whatever it should be modified so again come into the third attribute keeping in mind the same uh, images now comes the texture on the image on the right the left is of fibrous plaque it is homogeneous you can see the texture is homogeneous while image on the right is heterogeneous it's an image of a calcified plaque so the three attributes are uh, the back scatter attenuation and texture and if we plot this a uh, back scatter and attenuation various it, uh, morphologies will fall among uh, the different time zones depending upon whether there is a high back scattering or low attenuating and that is how you uh, basically identify your image whether this is calcium lipid or uh, red thrombus so uh, these are this is the basic if you have mastered this basic then you can easily analyze your image. taking into mind keeping into mind these attributes we let's see the, what a uh, normal artery looks like this is the imaging source this is a wire artifact in all the images first you should discount uh, and consider where the wire artifact is and then you can see the tell tale golden tube of three layers 
the three layers were the in highly backscattering intima, low backscatter media, and then uh, the backscattering adventitia made of collagen tissue. So if we, uh, modify, if we enlarge it, you can see the intima is the initial uh, structure, highly backscattering, which is then surrounded by media, which is of in, uh, in smooth muscles, and then which is bounded by adventitia. It is the media which is bounded on the outside by external elastic lamina and on the internal by the internal elastic lamina. The importance of this is that uh, we have to measure, take measurement from external elastic lamina to external elastic lamina, EEL to EEL. So this is media is intimized like a sponge. The uh, laminas are like a rubber band. Media is like a soft rope and adventitia is like a mesh. So this is the basic histology of a normal artery. Now see the various pathological structures. The fibrous plaque, as I told you, is a homogeneous structure of high backscattering. You can see this is a fibrous plaque, but here you can see in addition to fibrous, uh, you can see uh, that there is a light attenuation and the low backscattering. This is fibro fatty plaque, this is fat. And here you can see that the, you can see a low backscattering image, but you can see the posterior uh, leading edge, uh, the posterior at trailing edge, this is a calcium. And similarly, the red thrombus, white thrombus, and tissue protrusion. With practice, you will be able to decipher whether it is a uh, tissue protrusion or a red thrombus. So you have to do practice, practice, and practice. What is the importance of these morphological separation? As, as is uh, now, we all follow the MLD max algorithm. The first M is of morphology, which sets the stage for our decision making whether M, whether morphology is lipidic, fibrotic, calcific, or severely calcific, because based on that, you can define your further stenting uh, strategy, whether if it is lipidic or uh, you can do a direct stenting. If it is minimally fibrotic, you do choose a compliant balloon. If it is mild to moderate calcium, you, you choose nine non-compliant. If it is severe calcium, you can use rotablator, uh, IVL, or laser, or cutting balloon. So uh, this is how you should uh, use OCT morphology. And you can see, compare it with the IVAS where the, uh, the resolution is only 100 microns. So you, the image, uh, you have to do a lot of guesswork in this. I, the learning curve in IVAS is much more, which is OCT is much less. So you can see that with the OCT is 10 microns uh, resolution. You can even see the cholesterol crystals. You can see the micro uh, vessels, macrophages. The importance of these are that you can then define whether this is a stable plaque or a vulnerable plaque. Uh, so this is, uh, you can see the thin cap fiber only of 60 microns thickness. So if there is, if you can identify TCFA, then this is a vulnerable plaque and the patient uh, is a very highly, you have to put them on a high intensity statins. You have to reduce their lipids and you don't have to land your stentis at that TC thick far edges. So uh, this, as I, I'll uh, again show you, there's a repetition. This is a lipid pool, signal poor, high attenuated lesion. This is a thick far TCFA, 60 microns. Uh, I mean, this is a danger zone. You have to identify in your lipid pool where, whether there is a thick far TCFA or th thick far, uh, and then you can define cholesterol crystals, microvessels, and double back slicer. It is in the OCT in acute coronary syndrome, which, I, my, which is my, uh, in fact, I always emphasize there, because here people don't want to do because of citing their uh, image emergency and all that. But it is here that OCT is very important to differentiate between erosion and plaque rupture and calcified nodule as a cause of uh, uh, ero uh, ACS. Because in erosion, you don't have to put a uh, stent while in plaque rupture and calcified nodule, you should put a stent. Uh, so an erosion usually occurs in younger population so you don't have to basically put us a younger population. And this is especially amplified post COVID. Lots of patients are coming, uh, younger patients are coming with ACS, uh, 25 years old, 30 years old. You don't have to put uh, a stent there. Based only on an angiogram, you would have put a stent in this lesion. But if, if you do an imaging, you will find that this, is, this was an erosion. The patient was left. According to erosion one and erosion two study, the results are very, very good if you are leaving uh, patients of erosion only without any stenting. But unlike uh, erosion, if you suspect a uh, plaque rupture, then you should tack up uh, with a stent. So OCT is very, very uh, useful for differentiating between plaque erosion, plaque rupture, 
and you can even with practice identify macrophages and uh, so uh, this is uh, why i always emphasize in acute coronary syndrome especially in atypical presentation young patient you should try to define the morphology whether it is erosion rupture or calcified nodule so in, uh, in intervention is not just putting a stent intervention is also de determining when not to put a stent the patient will thank you for his life uh, with his life that you have not encased his uh, arteries in a metal jacket so this is a uh, oct of a calcium nodule jutting into the lumen you have to modify it uh, unfortunately we don't have an orbital atherectomy which is a modality of choice for calcium and calcium also you can see that how beautifully you can uh, quantify the calcium whether it is more than 500 micron thick more than 50% uh, uh, of the r and length of more than 5 mm this is a, a, a classification defined by fusino and we all rely upon it to determine whether this calcium can be cracked by simply a, a non compliant balloon or we have to use more debulking strategies and similarly, I will quickly now uh, 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 in, uh, tell you the role of OCT after stenting. And here, the MLD max, you have to see the length of the stent. You have to see the dissection. You have to see the expansion, the position. I will not go into the, all those details. Uh, the time is short. In the last one minute, I'll just cause you the, uh, tell you that uh, you have to be conversant about the artifacts also because you should not pose these artifacts as uh, some lesion. This is the commonest artifact, and this is the blood. This is your inadequate preparation and inadequate in injection. So with practice, you will be able to remove this artifact. And then bl blood in the imaging sheath also causes uh, dim structures. So you should flush your sheath with 100% uh, saline, 100% uh, contrast. This is a classical skew of artifact because of the rapid movement of the coronary. This is not a dissection or a flap. So, uh, and another thing is tangential drop off. This is not a thin cap fibroethinoma. This is a tangential signal drop off. So, uh, you should be aware of these uh, artifacts. So, my 15 minutes are now up as according to my timer. So, I'll just reiterate to my uh, fellows, junior fellows, that OCT tissue characterization is very, very important, especially in ACS, left main patients, and atypical presentations. And you should not say that it is time consuming, it is expensive, or it is uh, it has no data in uh, the data. There's ample data where you have basically changed the course of your decision making and helped the patient. And by just by uh, de describing your image in three attributes, attenuation, backscatter, and texture, you can define easily whether it is fibrous, lipidic, and calcified plaque and choose your correct strategy. So uh, there is no more excuses of not doing imaging. And uh, thank you very much for your patient uh, listening. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Goyal, you are muted. Dr. Goyal, you are muted. Uh, thank you, Nishit Chandra. Uh, I just wanted you to address one uh, question that uh, if you could uh, tell the, uh, the attendees as to which are the settings in which uh, OCT could be more useful. You know, you could list out a couple of situations. Yeah, so so uh, this is a very, very pertinent question, Dr. Goel, uh, asked according, especially in our Indian scenario, which is the, where the patient is paying from his own pocket. And it is an expensive device, no doubt about it. But yes, certain cases scenario, you don't have to do it in all the cases. There are certain scenarios where you should use OCT, especially if the presentation of ACS is atypical. It is a younger patient who is presenting to you, 30 years, 40 years, where you the chances of plaque and female, uh, young female, where the chances of plaque erosion are much more. There you have to, because uh, angiographically, you cannot differentiate between a plaque erosion versus a plaque rupture. You would definitely, put a stent, whether it is erosion or so. In younger patient presenting with ACS, in left main bifurcation cases, uh, where you have to clearly defined, define the plaque structure you, uh, the, the, uh, and dis decide your strategy. And now, with the available of IVL in calcified plaque, it is the, 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 to choose your appropriate strategy, whether you would be using a cutting balloon, if it is a superficial calcium, you have to use a rota. If it is a deep calcium, you have to use a cutting balloon. If it is a circumferential calcium, then IVL is the best option. 
no you cannot differentiate it by by a uh, ivus or and uh, uh, only from luminogram of an angiogram so you have to use a penetrating radar like uh, characteristic of an oct which defines the depth of calcium length of calcium and the arc of the calcium so uh, briefly only in selective cases where oct would make a difference in your and improve the outcome like bifurcations calciums left mains and acute uh, acs in young atypical presentations yeah good thank you uh, actually one situation where sometimes i like to use in addition one is the calcific as you said where stent expansion is very well seen by oct you know if you've done a uh, calcified lesion then do OCT to ensure a good stent expansion. Another very important and which I left out is situation, ISR. Yeah. Second ISR. situation sometimes is, you know, you have done the culprit in ACS and there is another lesion which is moderate-ish. So there, uh, there are some studies about looking into thin cap fibroethromas, which probably produce more events. So if that lesion is on the borderline, but it's a thin cap fibroethroma, then maybe uh, you can do it. So, you know, that is... Uh, so that is one another situation where OCT could help. And the mechanism of ISR. Yeah. That is very important. Because whether you would use a DEB cutting balloon or, yes. or another layer of stent. Yes. ISR is another situation. Okay. So with that, I think we can move to the second talk, uh, which is uh, basics of now IVAS uh, uh, and fundamentals of IVAS, which will be talked about by Dr. P.K. Sahu. Dr. Sahu, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think my slides and audio is uh, well heard. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, Dr. Chandra's talk has made my task a little bit simpler, but uh, definitely interpreting uh, IVAS is sometimes a little bit more difficult than OCT because OCT gives a very clear picture, but uh, those who are of the generation of which we are, if they must have used more of IVAS initially, following which uh, you OCT came. So I'll be basically talking about the basics and fundamentals about IVAS imaging. Uh, we always have a question about why we need uh, uh, imaging before and after an angio. Basically, what you see over here are two ladies walking, but what you see is basically a gorilla on the shadow. So it is exactly like that, that you have to have something more than angio to know what is going on. So intravascular ultrasound is basically an invasive imaging device to visualize the coronary cross-sectional anatomy and is superior to coronary angiography in assessing vessel size, calcium content, and lesion severity. Now, basically, it uses uh, what you call the sound waves to know uh, there is a catheter which uses the sound waves and tries to uh, acquire all the this thing that is uh, structures and changes into our structure, which you see on the IVAS uh, image as we usually see it. Now let us try to see what is the basics of this imaging. Now, first we have to know what is the normal coronary anatomy on IVAS, how is the image orientation? This is very difficult in uh, IVAS, in fact, compared to OCT, interpretation of the basic images, interpretation of the complex images and certain basic calculations. Now the normal coronary anatomy, if you see if a catheter is passed, you can see that this is the media that you can see, which is marked in green. Then you can see the blood all around, and then you can see the plaque. And at some spaces, you can see the calcium. So basically, these are the image, uh, this thing that you see in the cases of an IVAS. All the three layers, the antima, media, and the adventitia are all seen clearly. And if you see the intima is dense and will appear white, what you see is in the intima. Then the media is made of a homogeneous smooth muscle cells and does not reflex ultrasound. So it is black in color over here, what you see. This is the media. The adventitia has sheets of uh, collagen that reflect a low lot of ultrasound and appears white. So these are the three layers and the media is separate with the IEL and the, the internal elastic lamina and the external elastic lamina. If you see the structure, this looks like, like this exactly. So this is a normal coronary anatomy of a, some plaque and you can see this is the lumen, this is the, the thin plaque, this is the media and this is the external uh, this thing, elastic lamina and you can see the catheter in between. Coming to imaging orientation, we all know the coronary anatomy is how it is oriented. But when you take a pullback from the LED, you have to know that 
if you, st you imagine yourself standing in front of the uh, this thing that is console in with the two hands stretched what comes to first is to your left side the circumflex the diagonal and the diagonal two and what comes to your right side will be the septal will come so this is very important while taking and this is what you see you can see the guide wire you can see that this is a pericardium you can see specks of calcium and 90 degrees to it you can see the diagonal so the, this is how it is the diagonal is always uh, appear at 90 degrees to the septal and the LCX will always appear in the same direction as the diagonal branch. So don't confuse the diagonals with the uh, circumflex because they both will come in the same direction. And any structure you see at 90 degrees to this is the septals. Always pericardial is not on the top. You should remember that the operator must rotate the imaging in mind to match the rotation of IVS imaging and rotate the IVS imaging itself to match the imaging in mind. So it imagine a lot while interpreting all this. Now, this is just a LED pullback, which will show you the diagonal and the circumflex are coming on the same one side, and this, uh, this thing septal shall come on the other side at 90 degrees to each other. And first identify the pericardium, then it is easier for you to go. Now, if you go ahead, if you see the circumflex, if you see the circumflex, what you'll basically see that whatever comes to your right will be the LED, OM, PL, PD, but whatever comes to your left will be the LA branch. And so again, identify the pericardium, and then you can see the actual branch to the left, and you'll see the OM and the LED all coming to the right. So this orientation is extremely important because while interpreting the images, one has to know especially which is the branch which you're following up because nowadays we do a lot of no contrast or low contrast angioplasty. So image orientation is very important. Now coming to the right coronary artery, you can see whatever is to your left are the conus branch, the RV and the PD and the SN nodal branch will be towards the left. And this is what you see. It varies across individuals so far as the PDA and the, this thing is concerned, that is RV branch is concerned, then the SA nodal branch is concerned. Now coming to interpretation of the basic images, after image orientation wants to know what are the basic images. This is the grayscale that is followed. The gray is the most fatty and the whitest is the most calcium. In between is fibrous. There may be fibro fatty lesions, fibro calcific lesions. There may be any of these five types of lesions that might occur. These are the six basic images that one should be oriented to because the whole IVAS interpretation depends on this. This is a normal one where you see all the three layers. You can see the plaque, whether it is concentric or eccentric. Here you can see an eccentric plaque. Here you can see a soft plaque. You can see that is mainly black in color. You can see a fibrotic plaque over here. This is a fibrotic plaque, and this is where you can see dense calcium. The first orientation of the first interpretation is to know the six basic images. Now, what is a soft plaque? It is not as bright as the adventitia. It soft refers to the low echogenicity and the high lipid content and is mostly cellular in lesion. So these are the soft plaques that you see. Now, coming to the fibrotic plaque, these are brighter or brighter than the adventitia. This is somewhat hyperechoic. And majority of these are atherosclerotic lesions. They are fibrotic, they're very dense fibrous plaques and may cause so much of acoustic shadow that they may be misclassified as calcium. Now, this is a big plaque that you see some amount of fibrosis, some amount of calcium, some amount of uh, this thing, uh, soft plaque also. Now, calcific plaques are always very bright, almost white in color. And these results in the reverberation, the oscillation of the ultrasound with the transducer and the calcium causing repeated arcs. Now, once you have a calcium, you try to see how many quadrants are involved. If it is one quad less than one quadrant, it is mild. If it is up to 180 degree, it is moderate. If it is three up with more than 180, it is severe. This is how see how many quadrants, and then you can see whether it's superficial or it is deep. This is how you can quantify the calcium. Now, based on the morphology, you can decide whether if you have a soft or a fatty, fatty plaque, you can just pre-dilute the balloon and go with the stent. If it's a fibrotic plaque, because to avoid slippage or avoid plaque shift, you might have to use a cutting balloon, especially the osteal lesions, which are very fibrotic. And if a calcium lesion, you have to think of the rota or the IVL or the uh, listing that is uh, lithotripsy, whatever it is, to see. So based on the morphology, you can decide what is your strategy to be adopted. Now coming to the interpretation of complex images, complex images are again of these forms, either there's a dissection, there's a plaque rupture, there's a thrombus, there's a hematoma, or you may be in a false lumen. 
So in a dissection, you'll see that there is uh, this sort of a feature that we get a plaque. The plaque rupture, you can see a thrombus can be seen. If you are using HD imaging, you can easily see a thrombus. A hematoma can be seen also. This is very important to identify the hematoma. And you can see also the true lumen and the false lumen. These are dissected plaques. So you can see the plaque has been dissected. Here also you see there has been a dissection. These are another example of dissected plaques. So these are very important after you dilate whether you have dissected the plaques and to know the extent of dissection. Instant stones is very important to identify plaque morphology. These are usually soft structures, soft ecogenicity. And whenever you are in doubt, you try to flush the catheter so that you can easily see the tissue borders. Now, the question of inadequate expansion. See, this is a stent which is inadequately expanded. And this is a stent which is not opposed. So you have to differentiate between expansion and opposition. All stents may be expanded, but there may be unopposed stents. So it may be vice versa also. So while uh, imaging, you have to know what is expansion, what is opposition. Now, one wrong thing that we do is that we optimize the stent based on the plaque area. Do not optimize the stent based on the plaque area. Optimize the stent based on the stent lumen area. Supposing you've taken a 3.5 stent, don't go on dilating so that you see that the plaque is totally squeezed. So you choose the stent depending on the EL to EL. Uh, and then based on it, then you have to go whether you want to be aggressive or you want to be less aggressive. Now, there's an artifacts like the ring down artifact, the blood speckle artifact, the motion artifact. And whenever you see any artifacts, try to flush it down and then you can see it better. Now, coming to certain basic calculations, you also know, remember, all IVA assessments are to be done in end diastole. And here you see what is the lumen area and what is the diameter. And you take the lumen diameter in two, that is, perpendicular ways so that you can get the average of them. Now, the percentage of luminal area stenosis is very important. And that is how we calculate the plug burden. Because depending on the plug burden, you know if it is more than 70% or if the plug is uh, really eccentric or this thing that is uh, uh, concentric, you can decide. The plug area is the EL minus the lumen area. And the plaque burden is the plaque area divided by the EL area. These are certain important things because depending on the plaque burden, you start strategizing, strategizing what you have to do next. Now, you have to see what is the diameter you have to take. You have to see the length also. That is, what is the length? Take the two normal segments and take in the pullback. In the M mode, you see what is the IVUS length. And then this is quickly to show you that you take the normal segment, you take the normal segment, and this is the diameter that has to be seen in the lesion site. Now, always your optimal landing zone should be a segment less than 50%. Please remember this. If it's a diffuse of this artery, don't think of going on stenting to areas which is around 30%, 40%, but just land your segment of strength in less than 50%. So this is the eccentricity index. Concentricity is with the maximum plaque thickness is less than 1.3 times the minimal plaque thickness. Eccentricity is from 1.3 to 1.7, which is moderate, and more than 1.7, which is severe. Now, this incompetent stent opposition occurs in 10% cases where you can see that it is not opposed. It is easy, I mean, it's important to identify it so that you can post it and you can just have a good opposition. Now, high grade dissections are to be known if the lumen area narrowing is less than four or the dissection angle, you see the dissection angle is more than 60 degrees. It is almost 180 degrees dissection of the uh, this thing, edge dissections. And now, as we go, what we have been using till date are the 40 megahertz IVSS. is a non HD IVSS. Now, all machines are using the HD IVSS, which is a 60 megahertz. Now, what is the advantage of using a 60 megahertz? If you see the bandwidth, the bandwidth has got increased. Recording in progress. 60 megahertz. Now, this optical 60 megahertz catheters are to be used so that the imaging quality is very good. There's improved lateral resolution, there's improved axial resolution. And there's similar vessel penetration. So using wide bone catheters, this is just to show you what looks on a 40 megahertz and what looks on a 60 megahertz. So I basically showed you what are the basic images, how to take the basic uh, the thing measurements, and finally, how we have progressed from the 40 megahertz to the 60 megahertz catheters. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. I'd like to take any questions if there are any. I think Dr. Goel is busy. Somewhere. I agree, yes, sir. Yes. Dr. Rajesh. Is, yeah. Yes. Very good. Talk, sir. Dr. Sahu. I really enjoyed. Thank you. Sir. Very basic. And very good. 
So, uh, any Dr. Chanda, any comment about Dr. Saul's uh, presentation? And so, I, I just, yeah, so I want to, because there are very, uh, a question that is very frequently asked by uh, uh, younger generation who are now set settled in type uh, B towns, C towns, that if they have to invest in one modality of imaging, then which should we, which one we should invest in, IVERS or OCT? Because uh, obviously the costs are very high. Uh, basically, you see, I have both. Uh, I have two IVERS machines with me, both the forty and the non-HT IVERS, HT IVERS, and also the OCT. Sometimes what I do, I do a pre-assessment with uh, this thing that is uh, uh, OCT and then do a post-assessment with the IVAS. Or, But if you ask me what will be the best thing to invest, it will be definitely the HD IVAS. Because nowadays we're doing a lot of cases with low contrast or poor contrast, le 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 means very minimal contrast. The HD IVAS gives us very good images. But if you really want to have very good images and you are not uh, want to compromise on the images, definitely the OCT is better. But those who are from your generation, my generation, who have used a lot of IVSs, they'll be very comfortable using IVSs. But uh, with OCT use, it has increased, and no doubt, both machines are quite costly. So, Dr. Nishit, that is how will you like to take uh, two questions which have been yes. posted in the chat box. So the first one is about, uh, is it safe to give contrast for OCT in thrombus-containing ACS patient? And the second one is regarding spontaneous or iatrogenic dissection, which is the preference. This is followed by Dr. Sao, please. So, uh, regarding the first question, is it safe to give contrast in uh, thrombotic lesions? So, as a dictum, whenever there is a thrombus, you should first suck it out. You should suck it out, make lumen for uh, way for the contrast, and then you should inject. Because thrombus, <coughs> if thrombus is there, putting an OCT will not do. You will because uh, the light waves don't don't uh, do not penetrate thrombus. So the, the your imaging will be totally useless. So you have to basically first tear the thrombus by sucking out by a good thrombosuction and then do an OCT run. And regarding the second one, the uh, dissection. Uh, that is how any comment. Uh, uh, I think dissections are best seen in an OCT, and you can quantify the dissection, what is the arc of dissection, what is the medial dissection, intimal dissection. So dissections are best visualized in OCT, because it gives you exactly the strategy, and minor dissection and all you cannot see on an IVAS at all. It's very difficult at times, you have to stay, unless you are very accustomed to seeing these things, that is, dissections. But I will prefer an OCT for a dissection. So, uh, just for the knowledge of the fellows, uh, comment about uh, which is the minor and which is the major iatrogenic dissection which has to be taken care by say balloon dilatation or a stenting uh, following a stent placement across the current lesion. Any comment so, about that part? So, what is a major dissection? A major dissection is anything which is more than 60 degrees in angle, which has got a length more than 3 millimeters and which extends beyond the media into the, almost uh, beyond the media it extends. These are the three criteria which we should take for a major dissection. And if you have such a dissection, they have to be tackled. And if you see the dissection is not an, uh, an it, uh, it is an anti-grade dissection, then, but whatever it is, if it is a proximal dissection, you have to tackle it. If it's a distal dissection, you may leave it if it doesn't fulfill the criteria. <coughs> Any comments, Dr. Nishit? Yeah, so very rightly said that uh, earlier, uh, before this imaging era, any dissection we used to stent it. But now with this imaging, we can define whether it's, if it is a mild dissection, not covering more than 60 degrees or not corresponding to the, all these uh, criteria, then we can safely leave it. Because uh, the purpose of angiography, uh, the angioplasty is dissection. Angioplasty dissects. It, this is the way it works. So we should not be afraid of dissections. So thank you very much, uh, both the speaker, and let's go for the next uh, talk on uh, clinical evidence to support imaging learning from the clinical trials uh, by Dr. Mohan Mani. Dr. Mani, please. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, uh, sir, uh, Rajesh, sir. And uh, <clears throat> can I able to see my uh, slide? Yes, so we are able to see. Just have now. Uh, could you go to the full yeah, okay. screen, sir? Full screen, yes, sir. Yes. Thank now. you.
So after the very good talk uh, from the the basics of IVS and OCT, I would like to now uh, have a talk on how to implement that both uh, both IVS and OCT into the clinical practice. So we have an intracoronary imaging system like IVS, OCT, and as well as a NIRS, this near infrared spectroscopy. So <clears throat> when you have a <clears throat> that intravascular imaging modalities, we have various uh, uh, parts of uh, uh, intravascular imaging. Like IVS and uh, virtual histology, and as well as uh, OCT, near infrared spectroscopy, and as well as uh, angioscopy. So everything has its own value of interpreting the axial resolution and the stent expansion and complication, and necrotic core, and detection on the thin cap and thrombus, and stent tissue coverage, the expansive uh, remodeling, and as well as the measurement through the blood. So every every uh, modalities of intravascular uh, uh, imaging has its own value. See when you look at this, uh, uh, the, the slide said uh, that IVS and OCT has a major role uh, for that uh, majority of the things which I've been mentioned. And uh, if you take up that, that newer modality like a newer uh, the near infrared spectroscopy, it is majorly uh, been uh, applied for the necrotic core, as well as uh, heavily calcific uh, uh, the, uh, the the core lesion, which has been very much useful. The other setup, which is not been useful, but when you combine with the IVS, this has a more usefulness. So the evolution of intravascular imaging. So we have a, almost, as already sir said, uh, there has been a, the previous generation almost more than a 20 years of uh, uh, that IVS being which has been used along with angioscopy, and uh, now the past 10 years we have a OCT and OFDA OCT and as well as a near infrared spectroscopy from 2014, uh, I mean 2011, and uh, that uh, virtual uh, histology of IVS. So these are all the integrated backscatter IVS. So these are all the thing been the past 10 years we have a uh, imaging modalities. So in development we have a uh, the Roman spectroscopy, the time resolved laser induced fluoroscopy spectroscopy, and as well as the fluorescence angioscopy and molecular imaging, which has been upcoming uh, development in the intravascular imaging. Okay, now I'll move on to the thing. So, what is NERS? So, NERS has a similar like I was uh, uh, imaging evaluation, it has been started from 1990 from 2014 now. So, the device has been <clears throat> Uh, first in man in 2001 and subsequently the device been improved which is in 2006 then subsequently fd approval got in 2010 then finally uh, the the japan been regularly using with the nurse along with the ivs which is they have been using so this is one of the electromagnetic uh, uh, the, uh, the the infrared technology which has been used along with the ivs which has been very much useful for the uh, uh, doing the intravascular imaging guided pci uh, Dr. So Manik, sorry to, interrupt, of... sorry to interrupt this on the technical side, sir. You have a display. Can you just hide it at the bottom? Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Thank okay. you, sir. The clinical purpose of uh, intravascular imaging. So we all know the things, uh, imaging before PCA and imaging during PCA. So all the image, whatever you use, whether IVS or OCT, always we, have, we will think of the recognition of the plot severity and vessel sizing and calcific block and spontaneous dissection. So why we have to know about it? So better selection of the PCA strategy and devices like a debulking agent or a stent type or stent sizing, we could able to uh, uh, take it. And imaging during the PCI, so the recognition of stent molar position, so that will be useful for doing the post dilatation. And the tissue prolapse there, again, if it is by minimal tissue prolapse, we can leave it, or if we have a, a, a grass pisitrula, we can do the post dilatation and stent under expansion again we can do a post dilatation or edge dissection we can deal it with the uh, another uh, 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 the disc implementation so reduction of peri procedural complication and improvement of clinical outcome during due to low risk instant resnosis and thrombus rate will be uh, low when you do the image guided pci so where is the recommendation so recommendation for the intravascular imaging, it being combined with the FFR, that is a physiological assessment. So when evidence of ischemia is not available, so FFR is recommended to assess the hemodynamic relevance of intermediate grade stenosis. It's a class one level A indication. So FFR guided PCA should be considered in patient with multivessel disease undergoing PCA. That's a class two A indication. And I was to be uh, considered to assess the severity of unproductive left main lesion. This is again a class 2A recommendation. 
So again, so for the optimization of the PCA, so what is the recommendation? So we have the recommendation of IVS or OCT should be considered in selected patients to optimize stent implantation. That is a class 2A uh, recommendation. And IVS should be considered again the unprotected left main lesion, which is again a class 2A indication. So now, what are the trials we have it for to prove it used in the clinical, uh, 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 clinically IVS? So we have a various trials which has been available <clears throat> from the 2001 uh, to almost around 2019. We have uh, multiple studies, including RCTO, AVID, and uh, the, the Chinese trials, and as well as the CT IVS trial, and the Dipole, excellent trial, and home test trial, and ultimate. Those are all the trials. The, the half of the thing being been randomized to control trials. And the remaining things were observational trials. What does it say? All these IVS trials, what does it say? <clears throat> so it, it, whenever we see any trial, we always look up the four things. One is a major adverse uh, cardiac events and cardiovascular death and myocardial infarction and target vascular revascularization. So all these things, when you look at this graph, so when you uses the IVS, so it will be reduced maze rate and as well as a reduced cardiovascular death and reduced myocardial infarction and reduced target vascular uh, revascularization. So that's what the study, all this study, which has been almost a 10 to 12 years of studies, which has been submitted that, which shows the same thing. So the role of IVS in lesion significance. So that is the pressure derived hemodynamic assessment is a gold standard method for differing revascularization that we all know the thing, especially in non LMCA stable coronary artery disease and LMCA sizing demonstrate less variability than other major epicardial vessels and cutoff values. We know the thing less than six and as well as more than point uh, more than 4.5 millimeters square to predict the functional impact to have a validate with the IVS. So it has been studied in Western studies also. We have a studies with the Asian population also. So the LMC IVS derived MLA more than six millimeter square can be considered as a non ischemic. And LMC IVS derived MLA, which has been less than 4.5 millimeter square can be considered as ischemic generating. And LMC IVS derived MLA of 4.5 to 6 suggestive of additional invasive method or non invasive method to prove the whether ischemia is there or not. And another thing is MLA measurement of non LMCA lesions are not recommended for the assessment of the lesion significant due to various according to vessel calibration and as well as a subtended myocardium. So, so if we look at that in, in comprehensive way, this, uh, uh, this photograph says that thing. When you have a MLA less than 4.5 millimeter square revascularization to be done. If it has been a more than six millimeter square, you can do a conservative management. If it has been a 4.5 to six millimeter square, consider physiological assessment. So that is what the previous slides interpretation. So the role of imaging. So the role of uh, imaging in vulnerable plaque detection. So we all know the thing, as I already told you, the plaque detection has been a important to uh, uh, talk about the maze rate in the particular patient. So IVS defined plaque burden, which is more than 60 to 70 percent, is a predictive of subsequent maze rate. And lipid rich plaque again is a predictor of plaque vulnerability. And OCT, IVS both can detect the, this plaque characteristic uh, identification. So invasive plaque characterization provides superior positive predictive value of future events than the CT coronary angiogram by the calcium score assessment and identification of presumable high risk plaque characteristic using IVS, OCT or both combination of NIS IVS can be considered to identify high risk patient who will be benefited from the, uh, the risk modification therapy by this. So this is a comparison of uh, IVS and as well as OCT and NIRS and the CT angiogram and the CT calcium score. Uh, so to assess the, the positive predictive value and as well as a negative predictive value of the imaging modality. So we have a couple of studies for the thing and you so I was uh, combined study of like a prospective study or a atherorimo IVAS or a prediction study. Uh, these are all the thing being IVAS studies and clima and we have a uh, the promise study for the CT angiogram and again a, for the CT calcium score for with the, again a promise sub study. So what is it says it says the thing. The, the maze rate uh, will be high uh, when you have a, uh, that plaque burden of more than 70 percent. 
so that's what the study says so this has been a study been conducted follow up almost maximum of 3 years the minimum of 1 uh, year so the negative predictive value of this uh, uh, the intravascular imaging is been very very useful and what about acs situation so how do you deal it so in acs situation we all know the thing we have a three types of category one is a normal type of coronary and non obstructive uh, coronary artery disease and obstructive cad so whenever you have a findings of multi vessel disease or you don't know that which one is a culprit vessel or there is a hasty lesion in the uh, one of the blood vessel or a calcification which has been noted or a tortuosity and eccentricity of the lesion uh, or ecg uh, in, if it suppose if it is a non obstructive coronary artery disease with the ecg changes uh, re uh, regional valvular abnormality but angiogenesis ambiguity there then you can go for the intravascular imaging suppose normal coronaries are there but lv assessment if you do a angio or a, uh, uh, the transfer as echo if we found out there is a regional valvular abnormality or there is a epical ballooning again you can do the intravascular uh, uh, imaging and see the thing what is the exact thing which has been happening in the uh, vessel so we can able to identify the plaque event and culprit identification and calcification and plaque rupture block erosion so according to that you can make a decision on it in the aca situation so in th that's why this intravascular imaging is useful so ivs and oct criteria for optimizing the stent so both can be used for the optimizing the stent so what is the criteria for it so the relative stent expansion which has been more than 80 percentage should be obtained as a routine clinical practice and <clears throat> the msa of more than 5.5 mm square by ivs and a more than 4.5 mm square by oct should be achieved in all the non left main lesions so that is a criteria so all the fellows has to know about it and the clinical relevance of acute mal opposition is uncertain so expansive mal opposition after stent implantation should be definitely should be avoided and acute mal opposition is less than 0.4 mm uh, and the longitudinal extension which has been less than 1 mm again we 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 can we can uh, uh, leave it the cut off requires prospective validation and the tissue prolapse in acss as compared with the stable cad is adversely related to the outcome if it is a more amount of tissue prolapse again the, the reclosure rate will be uh, more and so large uh, the dissection detected by the ivs or oct there is a independent predictor of mes as already the previous uh, uh, the speaker been told up to the medial level if it is a dissection been extended definitely it have the mes rate will be more and the stent edge hematoma which is already been mentioned by the uh, that ivs uh, or uh, the oct you can able to see the thing the stent edge hematoma uh, uh, by the <coughs> imaging technique so you, you can avoid the residual stent edge stenosis by doing the over expansion so this is for the optimized pca as i already told the previous one so whenever you you look for the optimized pca you have to think the uh, distal uh, reference of the vessel proximal reference of the vessel and what is the msa of the vessel so in that you have to see the dissection that has been less than 60 degree flap limited to only intima and less than 2 mm length and again uh, no extensive protrusion that means the tissue prolapse is not there and the mal opposition is not there axial distance is less than 0.4 mm and the less than 1 mm in length so you have done a, achieved the optimized pca so as i already told with the previous uh, the slide the msa of more than 5.5 mm square with ivs or the 4.5 mm uh, square with the oct it has been a acceptable uh, uh, indication so it is by the ivs and oct so ivs guided pca definitely improves the clinical outcomes in selected patients especially long lesions cto lesions so only thing is we have a the, the combining ivs and oct guided uh, pca data which has been less but both are very good than the uh, conventional doing only with the angiographic uh, pca and uh, the left main lesion should be always to be considered with the image guided pca either by the uh, ivs or oct Uh, except the osteal uh, lesions we could able to manage with the uh, uh, oct and osteal lesion is there then you can do with the ivs so there is a stronger evidence on the advantages of intravascular imaging as i already told you in ac situation and lesion morphology and uh, that a patient presenting with what kind of uh, uh, acs he is having so age consideration all the thing will play a bigger role in ac situation so oct for guidance of pca <clears throat> is more user friendly so you can uh, the the interpreting ivs is 
little difficult, but OCT is interpreting is little easier. And additional indication favoring for OCT is a, again a stent thrombosis or a resinosis uh, rate. And the patient at high risk of developing contrast induced acute kidney injury can be benefited by the IVS rather than the OCT uh, guided PCA. <clears throat> so the calcium and lipid rich plug again uh, OCT versus IVS. So what is the thing will be used? So OCT in contrast to IVS can be often assessed for the calcium thickness because when you want to know about the total calcium mark, which has been more than 180 degree or a 90 degree or a, a, a 360 degree or a, what is the calcium thickness, which has been more than 0.5 millimeter because it carries a greater risk of stent under expansion. So evidence of calcium fractures after the, uh, the imaging, again, you will improve the, uh, the stent expansion rate. And if the case of more than 180 degree calcium pull, the absence of calcium fracture definitely will have a problem in expansion of the strength. So although stenting of lipid rich plugs is related to an increased risk of periprocedural MI and no uh, reflow, the procedural consequences of lipid and necrotic pull reduction by OCT and IVS definitely uh, the, the prior to PCA remains still being an uncertainty uh, in that certain things because we, we don't know that why this is all the thing been happening. So the calcium by that uh, the intravascular imaging, I shown in the one picture that uh, that NIRS chemogram where you see the red line. Red line will show the uh, the majority of the uh, the, 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 the the lipid uh, the, the calcium and the remaining area being lesser calcium. So when you come in with the NIRS along with the IVS, you can able to see that picture in the B that which says that where you have a more and more red, there is a calcium is more and more deposited there. So here it is around almost 180 degree of calcium. So in the example case, and uh, again, a OCT have a, uh, that you can able to see that uh, thickness and as well as the uh, arc of the calcium. So again, now coming back to the uh, stent sizing. So will it be useful that intravascular imaging? Yeah, definitely. I was an OCT is definitely been useful in that part. So the beneficial effect of image guided PCA does not appear to be strictly linked to algorithm, which is used for stent sizing by the IVS or OCT. So practical standpoint is very clear. The distal lumen reference you have to see, proximal lumen reference you have to see, you have to go ahead with the uh, distal lumen reference. That has been an ideal choice of uh, doing the uh, one. And uh, if you are being a OCT, you can go ahead with the uh, ULTEL. Um, uh, or if you are using IVUS, you can use, take a lumen area and you can do with the uh, sizing of the stent. When using a OCT, the EEM reference based sizing strategy appears feasibly. Although more challenging than a lumen based approach for routine clinical practice because that uh, the, 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 the passage of the, two, the resolution is good, but only thing is the penetration power of the OCT is little less. So where it, sometimes you cannot able to get the uh, that entire uh, layer of the vessel. And appropriate selection of the landing zone is definitely very crucial. Wherever there is a less than 50% of uh, uh, the block burden is there, you can land up there. So you don't need to worry about the thing. Uh, no, no, there is a plug button is there. I don't want to land it. So you don't need to extend the stent beyond that limit when he uses the uh, uh, the image guided PCI. And the co-registration of angiography with the IVUS or OCT definitely been very useful uh, to uh, find out what is the de uh, determination of the, uh, the stent length and as well as that uh, osteolation lesion uh, 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 PCI to be very much useful. So this is a simplified criteria to uh, have a, um, a OCT and IVS. So OCT had to be a little bit uh, less aggressive and IVS you can have a uh, conservative to take the uh, stent sizes. So this has been an example, uh, uh, the, the millimeter which has been mentioned. So always you have to take a distal reference and the proximal reference. So go with the distal reference and uh, uh, take up the stent according to that. So sorry, you'll have to sum and up, sir. We have run yeah. out of time, sir. Yeah, I'm going to finish it. So, so I was in again uh, uh, the early stent thrombosis and late, thr uh, late stent thrombosis. Definitely, it has been very, very much useful. So, uncovered stent, molar position, the under expansion, and edge dissection can be directed. So, these are all the following studies which has been used for it. And this is a OCT trials. Again, a Illumin, Opinion, Doctors, and OCT. Uh, the OCT ACS, those are all the trends been supporting for the OCT, but not like IVS, uh, we have a, a longer OCT trials. So this is the advantage of IVS and OCT, uh, uh, when to use IVS and when to use the OCT. <clears throat> and uh, so the take-home message is very clear that 
the angiographically unclear ambiguous findings so either a dissection or thrombus calcific nodule use the uh, intravascular imaging assessment of left main stenosis again use the intravascular imaging the complex bifurcation lesion suspected culprit lesion of acs or a long lesion chronic total occlusion patient with acs left main coronary artery lesion two stent bifurcation and the restenosis rate and stent thrombosis and a patient with renal dysfunction again with ivs so these are all the clinical implementation of the intravascular image thank you thanks morgan that is an exhaustive talk covering all the basic aspects of the imaging uh, if we have one or two comments otherwise for want of time we'll just move to the next talk we are running short of time any thank comments you, from sir. other faculty In meantime uh, ajay sir is ready with his talk any any comments from any other faculty actually uh, all these imaging uh, modules are certainly better than angiography but the but the one issue is there to do a good angiogram and interpret a good angiogram is equally important like there was a very good picture shown by dr sahu on two girls walking and the image looks like a gorilla but one if one understands that you do the concept of orthogonal imaging then on the angiogram if you do a perpendicular angle you will probably separate the gorilla into two girls so you know these things are equally important although the imaging modalities are certainly have a edge over angiogram so this is one thing which i wanted to put yeah shall we go ahead with the next talk sir yeah please let us go to the next talk ajay sir please go ahead with your talk uh, good afternoon vijay good afternoon uh, dr rajesh good afternoon praveen sir is my slide visible yeah yeah go ahead sir okay so i think we are a little short of time so i will try and stop at the important slides i have the daunting task before i begin my salutations to my teachers some of whom are in the audience and some of whom are not uh this is a talk on the basics and fundamentals of coronary physiology it's a very exhaustive topic and we can't possibly look at everything but we will see why we need to do it so the location of disease in a patient with angina can either be in the epicardial vessel in the flow distribution vessels or in the distal part of the microcirculation and uh, we essentially are good at taking away stenosis at the epicardial vessel but to decide how much is the disease there is the problem that we have a coronary anatomy alone does not adequately reflect the functional severity of a coronary stenosis so the in addition to the variability of the difficulty in deciding how stenosed is the lesion the functional assessment of the lesion needs a little more information before we come to a final conclusion and for decades cardiologists have looked and looked and looked and uh, finally a way to look at the physiological stenosis severity has been found and its impact on myocardial perfusion has been found also more reliably now the basic principle is that flow across pressure across a flow is a product of flow versus the resistance and if one takes the resistance away then the change of pressure is directly proportional to the flow now since we are unable to measure the flow we use the pressure as a surrogate marker by taking the resistance away that means if one has a stenosis flow before and flow after cannot be measured but if one takes away the distal resistance the pressure before and the pressure after ratio is a surrogate marker of the change in flow that occurs across robust autoregulatory mechanisms actually keep the flow constant and if the resistance is thus kept as close as possible to constant we are able to assess the stenosis and decide if it is flow limiting by looking at the change in pressure this essentially must be recorded during the maximal achievable flow and this is the central concept of the measurement of the fractional flow reserve now the definition of ffr or fractional flow reserve is thus the maximum achievable blood flow in a stenotic coronary artery divided the maximum blood flow in the same artery without stenosis how we do it is we achieve maximal hyperemia measure the pressure proximal that comes from the guide measure the pressure distal from a wire that we place across the stenosis and create a ratio between these two there is evidence to show that anything less than 0.75 is definitely flow limiting for safety this has been extended to 0.8 that's the questions that we need to look at in the next 10 minutes is does angiography assess the stenosis severity adequately does ffr guided intervention actually compare with angiography based intervention is there any evidence that ffr guided intervention is better does ffr predict the natural history of coronary artery disease in this particular part of the coronary tree can it be used to measure an endpoint during the procedure 
what is our current treatment strategy and can we improve it? So what's wrong with angiography? And we look at these two simple images, a 58 year old man with a positive family history, negative risk factors, and he's got something that looks like a tight stenosis in the mid segment of the RCA. Another 55 year old man with no risk factors, the angiography shows a long moderate stenosis on, in the proximal and the mid left anterior descending artery. And the FFR provides the answer. The lesion in the RCA, which looks tight, is actually negative as far as FFR is concerned with a value of 0.86, whereas the long moderate stenosis in the proximal and mid LED has an FFR of 0.69 and thus needs to be addressed. Now, FFR actually also accounts for the size of the perfusion area, the magnitude of the perfusion area. A similar stenosis in an artery which actually supplies a very large perfusion area of same size, another artery which is of the same size but supplies a very small perfusion area, you can see that the FFR that's measured across, both of them angiographically look like they are 60 to 70% stenosed. Vessel size is also the same, but the FFR in the artery which supplies the large perfusion area is 0 0.6, and the FFR in the artery which supplies a smaller perfusion area is 0 0.85, and that was illustrated in the previous example that we looked at in the right coronary artery. Thus, additionally, it also accounts for viability. This is derived from the previous slide wherein the magnitude of the amount of normal myocardium which is supplied by a larger vessel will always likely be more significant and it also accounts intuitively for the amount of scar tissue. So the same vessel, again with the same stenosis, supplying a normal myocardium and another one supplying scar tissue, FFR is 0.6 in the artery which supplies normal myocardium and 0.8 in the same size vessel with identical stenosis when it supplies a scar tissue. In addition, it also occurs, accounts for collateral circulation and thus in the presence of collaterals, one can come to clear conclusions as to whether lesion is significant or otherwise. Thus, FFR incorporates stenosis severity, myocardial territory and viability and collateral perfusion. And this has been shown over a decade and a half ago. Decision making can thus guide the diagnostic procedure. Is it significant or otherwise? What about the PCI procedure and for evaluation for outcomes? Let's look at two situations. This is a patient with a lateral wall MI, had underwent a PCI to the circumflex seven days prior. He's got an intermediate stenosis in the LAD, and one is not really sure as to how significant this is in the proximal LAD. In multiple views, it appears 60 to 70%, maybe more when, looks at, when one looks at it angiographically. This is another situation in which there is an intermediate stenosis in the proximal LAD is come with an RCA infarction and this has been fixed. The mid RCA has been fixed. Now we have an intermediate stenosis in the proximal circumflex and the long intermediate stenosis in the proximal LED. The OM2 is 90% stenosed. So this is definitely needs to be done. Now angiography we know can be misleading. This is a slide taken from a very the famed study. And this shows that when the stenosis is 50 to 70%, the MLIS classification is quite significant. When it is 50 to 60 percent, 70%, nearly 35% patient, percent of patients of lesions are actually significant, whereas currently they would have been left. So it's not that the FFR always decreases the number of procedures or the number of interventions, because a large number of interventions, even in the intermediate range, will actually turn out to be significant if they're interrogated with an FFR wire. In the 71 to 90%, 20% are actually not significant. So 80% are, but 20% are not significant. The amazing part is 91 to 99% also, this is data drawn from the FAME study, 4% are actually <coughs> non-obstructive when interrogated by the FFR. What about routine FFR? We do, we've just seen from the previous slide that even 50 to 70% could be significant. Thus, there were some studies in which patients being investigated for chest pain underwent FFR of all patent vessels, which were larger than 2.25 millimeters in diameter, regardless of the amount of stenosis. And uh, to their surprise, they found that some number of even 0 to 30% stenosis by angiogram were actually significant. Similarly, to 31 to 50% patients, 51 to 70% and greater than 70%, of course, a large number were significant. Thus, routine pressure wire use, even in diagnostic angiogram, actually changed the significance of lesion stenosis and as far as its assessment is concerned. And large number of patients could be reclassified based on physiology. This is routine physiology in all vessels. These are other three trials which have shown the same thing, R3F, the post it the ripcord and the pooled. And a strategy change was seen in a routinely nearly in about 40% of patients across the board in all these uh, subset of patients who underwent routine FFR. 
as far as the angiogram is concerned. Concluding, the routine use of FFR resulted in a significant change in 44% in post-treat and 43% in R3F and 26% in the record. All the three studies, a change in judgment as to whether it was significant was found. And the R3F actually showed that it was safe to perfuse, uh, pursue a revascularization strategy divergent to that suggested by angiography because these patients underwent follow-up for a an year. And in post-it, that included a significant proportion of ACS patients, although that hasn't been accepted by all. Now, what about the natural history of coronary artery disease? We know it tells us how significant the lesion is today, but what is this lesion going to do with time? This is FAME 2, and uh, in the randomized part, patients with at least one stenosis and SFR of less than 0.8 were randomized to PCI plus medical therapy or medical therapy alone. And it was found that there was a significant change. In fact, this is more like a linear curve. As the FFR comes down, the incidence of MACE keeps going up. There are a few bumps here and there, but if one looks at the curve, it's pretty much uniform, and the FFR actually predicts what happens over the next half a decade if one looks at these lesions in that particular lesion. This is the same thing in a different way, and it shows that this curve is actually almost linear and uniform. The MACE rate actually goes up along with this FFR all the way. What about FFR-guided PCI? We have seen so far that FFR helps us to see whether the lesion is significant or otherwise. And it also tells us the natural history. What about FFR guided PCI? If we look at five-year outcomes with PCI guided by fractional flow reserve, in FAME 2, Dynami 3, Primality, and the Compare Acute, these are the three trials in which patients underwent one-is-to-one -one randomization, FFR guided versus medical therapy in patients who had um, PCI. And FFR guided PCI showed us consistently a better result with fewer MACE cumulative incident out to five years. So over the next half a decade, we are able to halve the adverse events which are caused by coronary artery, progressive coronary artery disease if one uses FFR to guide our PCI strategies. What about post-PCI FFR? Although this is an old slide, it's extremely useful and this is something that we are currently working on. If one looks at FFR post-stent deployment, the restenosis frequency out to six months to one year following was less than 5%, although this is from a bare metal era. And these data falls to 30% in case the FFR post-PCI was between 0.75 to 0.8. That means one third of patients who had these poor quality results on FFR actually came back with restenosis. This has been shown in a study which is about five, six years old, but it shows the same thing, that the post-PCI FFR actually predicts the occurrence of events and there is furious research going on in this particular area as of now. Results of intervention, as we have seen thus, are very strongly influenced by what kind of um, flows and pressures we get distilled to the lesion at the end of the procedure. The concept of FFR-guided revast thus is based on well-structured and consistent RCT-based evidence and firm clinical outcome data based on the DEFER, the FAME, the FAME-2, and the FAME-2 two-year, five-year results. Ideally, all coronary angiograms for chronic stable angina must undergo physiological assessment. All intermediate lesions in single vessel disease must undergo physiological, um, uh, physiological assessment prior to intervention. Almost all multivessel patients. ACS patients in non-culprit vessels is another area of furious research, although some, sometimes the plaque morphology seems to have a, an equal, if not a more or a higher predictive value as far as the occurrence of future events is concerned. Post-PCI to predict outcome, as we've shown, is another area of research that we probably need to look at a little better. When should we not use FFR? In patients who have got typical angina and ischemia or non-invasive testing in a region which is already supplied by a vessel with a high-grade stenosis, there's not much role for an FFR here. Culprit vessel of a STEMI, there are so many variables that it is not really very, uh, how do we say, useful to interrogate a culprit vessel of a STEMI with an FFR wire. And if the FFR result is not going to change the treatment plan, that we already know what we're going to do, in that case, an FFR should not be done. What about clinical utility? And is it used everywhere? Despite excellent long-term data showing improved outcomes with decision-making, only 6% of the time is FFR being used for the interrogation of intermediate coronary lesions. And I assure you, when we start using it more and more in the lab, even more than imaging, Probably this is going to be more scientific based and it has much more data to support its use. This is not to decry imaging. Imaging is excellent and helps us do a good, do a good job. But the, whether we need to go in or not is decided by physiology. 
This is what we propose. It has a role in both stable angina and unstable angina. In stable angina, one has an intermediate lesion. Go ahead and perform the FFR. And then in case it's less than 0.8, go ahead for the PCI. Greater than 0.8, OMT. If it is severe stenosis, greater than 90% FFR is not recommended because we'll be only doing an excessive intervention in 4% of the patients. FFR is recommended in case if it is 70 to 90%. If it is less than 0.8, go ahead for a PCI. If it is greater than 0.8, OMT. Non-culprit lesion interrogation, FFR is recommended and can be used to make decisions as far as intervention is concerned. What about the future? We've got so many others, contrast, FFR, etc. What happened to our two patients? This is the first situation, the lateral wall MI. The LAD was interrogated and we found that the FFR was 0.83 and so it could be left alone. The second situation, the tight proximal circumflex and the intermediate lesion in the proximal LAD after the RCA was fixed. Pre-PCI, the FFR was 0.74 in the LAD and actually the circumflex was insignificant with 0.9. Post PCI, we got a 0.9 result for the FFR. This is something that we are doing in our lab. We routinely measure FFR post PCI as well. Thank you for your attention, and I should be glad to take any questions. Nick, um, faculty, said it's, it's an excellent talk. Uh, summarized everything in 15 minutes. Any other com any comments from? Yeah, Where's very good, very good talk. I would say. Uh, I just wanted to highlight one point that, you know, recommendations wise, we certainly are better off with FFR and we need FFR in a large variety of cases, starting from 30% to 80% to be uh, lesions which you interpret as 30 to 80. But in this, there is a soft thing which I have experienced over time and I would like to add that lesions which may look more severe, but are very short you will have less positivity uh, on FFR, means it will be less ischemia producing as against lesions which may look moderate but are long. So always if you keep that in mind and uh, then probably you will be able to predict what the FFR would be and you will be correct in more than 90% of it. This is just an angiographic trick that I'm talking about because I talk more of angiograms. I know FFR has its uh, weight everywhere, but if you look at moderate, if the lesion is long, even moderate, it may come out similar. And that's what I think he showed on the LAD example and the RCA example, which he showed, looked severe, but was very short. So so that is the point that uh, should be kept in mind. Yeah. Yeah. If uh, there are any more uh, yeah. Radio yeah. shares. Excellent, excellent presentation, Rajiv, sir, as usual. Uh, sir, I just want to comment on this. Uh, like, if we were to measure the FFR in all the vessels with the 30% stenosis, uh, and actually they did it in the recently recently presented RIPCOT 2 trial, and they found that uh, uh, FFR was not useful. That's probably because uh, we have to take into account the pretest probability of uh, uh, that lesion producing the symptoms. So what they did was they did 30, uh, they did uh, FFR to all those vessels. This is, this is just 2.25, 30%. FFR is positive, they stand. The burden of ischemia is actually less. So I think that is probably one of the reasons why RIPCOT 2 actually failed to show that FFR guided strategy routinely is beneficial. Although we don't have the publication for that, but uh, some people went on to the extent that after RIPCOT, it is RIP, rest in peace FFR, but probably it is not. Uh, true. Okay, it's a great point, sir. And it says that, you know, common sense should be our guiding principle when we perform any yeah. and put a patient on the table. You know, at one extreme is to take every patient who has no symptoms, put them on the table and do an FFR for everything and say that FFR is useless. And the other extreme is to say patients who have got, you know, extreme diffuse disease and then do FFR. The truth actually lies somewhere in between. FFR. Yeah, you have between. to. Correct. So the, the you have to be very selective on it. You have to know when to use it. I think that's very important. So it, it's important yeah. basically to give the message that it tells us when to intervene in a patient in whom we are not absolutely sure. As I said, somebody who's got a 90% lesion and he's got demonstrated ischemia in that particular territory, there is absolutely no point in doing an FFR. But in addition, if there is another 70% or 60% or 50% and he's come to us with angina and we are not really sure which vessel do we need to handle. 
that is where FFR has its greatest defining role, and uh, that exactly. is what we look at. Ajay, okay. for the knowledge of the fellows who are joining the meeting, uh, what should be the mode of administration for the adenos in intracoronary or intravenous, and uh, what's the advantage in the drawback? So it's a great point, sir. The problem with FFR is that there are so many small pitfalls. The important thing is the ability to achieve complete hyperemia. The point that Dr. Rajesh has raised is extremely necessary because if we are unable to achieve hyperemia, then the whole measurement is vitiated. There are two basic routes. Intravenous adenosine, 140 micrograms per kg, is the dose that has been validated worldwide. In our lab, we actually started doing increasing intracoronary use, starting from 25, 50, 100, 150, 200, in both the RCA and the LCA, and actually stopped when, with increasing dilutions, we found the same results. The same modality was followed and has been recommended by people worldwide. They use 100 micrograms for the RCA intracoronary and 200 micrograms for the left coronary artery, and that seems to give as good with a very, very little inter-observer variability and excellent reproducibility. The problem is in patients in whom one is unable to deliver the intracoronary dose correctly, like somebody with left main disease or somebody with osteal disease, in which case one has to, resolve, to resort to the intravenous use. Abroad, there is a lot of talk about expense of adenosine. It's a little cheaper to use in India, but however, it's very difficult to get those doses unless you have the infusion pump, which is able to give you 100 ml per hour. Unless you have those large infusions, that is how we started because the initial even if you make the maximum dilution, the injection rate comes out to be something like 75 ml per hour. And that's very difficult on the infusion pumps, which are less than 50. That's why we switched to the intracoronary. I hope I've answered it. Essentially, unselected, non-dominant left coronary, uh, left uh, circumflex, 100 micrograms for the RCA, 200 micrograms for the LCA, assuming that there is no left main disease and there is no osteal disease. I hope that answers the question. Actually, on this, I will just add that uh, giving the intracoronary, I think there is a lot of technical snag in that sometimes because the moment you give, there is an instantaneous effect. It goes into the coronary. And then uh, if you take a little while in measuring the FFR or starting the recording or something, and then it uh, washes out. I have been using only IV and I find IV to be much better. And you need infusions in the rates of about 200 plus ml per hour. Uh, whatever. Uh, otherwise, the uh, amount of adenosine vials are uh, too many. That, has to be. that is the only downside well, of it. The technique of giving is to give it within two cardiac cycles. And you must follow it up with a flush. So you have the flush preloaded. You give nitroglycerin earlier so you get maximum epicardial dilatation. Thereafter, we have... The calculated dose is pushed and within one cardiac cycle, it is flushed and immediately the mm. measurement starts. Most of the time, yeah. 8 to 10 cardiac cycles is the time in which it washes out from the circulation and those are the cardiac cycles that we need to take the measurement. Yeah. So, thank you, Dr. Ajay and uh, Dr. Goel. You please uh, invite the next presenter, Dr. Rajesh Mulidharan, for the talk. I think now we're going to the last talk by Dr. Rajesh Mulidharan. So, uh, Dr. Rajesh Murli Tharan, please, what is the title of the talk? I'll have to check it out. Um, it's a non hyperemic uh, Yeah, it is RFR. It is on uh, resting full cycle ratio. So, RFR is, so now we're yeah. talking of adenosine. So, let us see what we can do on resting gradient. Yeah. So without, okay. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, uh, good evening, Vijay. Uh, happy to see you after a long time. Uh, so my topic is quite specific, uh, actually, on resting full cycle ratio, something called RFR, so which is a non-hyperemic pressure ratio. Now, as we all know, the safety of deferral of coronary of interventions for coronary stenosis is fairly well established now. Uh, it is now considered that a strategy of deferral based on IFR which is a non-hyperemic pressure ratio, is considered non-inferior to a strategy of referral based on FFR. This is largely after the publication of the defined flare as well as the IFR sweetheart trial. Uh, these were essentially non-inferiority trial designs which considered an FFR-guided PCI versus an IFR-guided PCI. The beauty of this trial was that this trial was that, uh, that they used cutoff points, specific cutoff points. 
that is 0.89 for IFR and 0 0.80 for uh, FFR. So in these two trials, which were published simultaneously in 2017 in New England Journal of Medicine, they showed that the, safe, the coronary intervention can be safely deferred if you have having an IFR value of 0.8, more than 0.89 or an FFR value of 0 0.80. So this was specific for IFR. But then people started asking the question, is the wave-free period, which is where the IFR should be measured, so unique that no other measurement would be valid or as useful? This was because IFR, the problem was that it was the software was confined to the realms of a particular company and you don't have access to any other things. IFR is measured in the wave-free period of, of diastole where the PD by PA is measured. Now, things really opened up after the publication of this paper by Van Tweer, which showed that there is nothing sacrosanct about IFR. They measured the diastolic pressure ratios in various phases of diastole, the diastolic pressure ratio in amongst the whole of diastole, 25 to 75% of diastole, the mid part of diastole, and they measured the IFR using not the usual, usual software, proprietary software, but they're using a MATLAB. They measured it, the IFR after 50 seconds, that is minus 50 seconds into the wave-free period, and IFR minus 100 milliseconds into the wave-free period. And what they found was that all of these measures actually had the same diagnostic accuracy. If you look at the sensitivity and specificity, you can see that all the curves are pretty much stacked up at the bottom, at the top of the uh, top of the graph, and the diagnostic accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, uh, positive predictive value, as well as the negative predictive value, all these measures are fairly equal. So this broke the concept that IFR was something actually unique, and this brought in the concept that you can measure it anywhere in diastole, provided you are using the right software and the right method. So this really have opened up the field of non-hyperemic pressure ratio. So in 2021, you have at least six hyper, non-hyperemic pressure ratios. We won't go into the PD by PA or the resting whole cycle PD by PA, which is the average PD by PA during the entire cardiac cycle, which can be measured by any company's, any company's software. But all others are proprietary to particular companies, all of them have patented it. And the more important point is that all of them have the essential cutoff point of 0.89. So it's not only about IFR, but about any of the diastolic pressure ratios that we use. Now we'll specifically talk about one of the pressure ratios that is the resting full cycle ratio, which is proprietary to Abbott. Uh, here I have shown which is the number of beats that are used to calculate or arrive at this value of 0.89 or in other words the software senses the pd by pa in five five four to five beats and then gives you the value that's how this value is arrived upon now what is resting full cycle ratio the ffr is measured as the average pd by pa over a full cycle after you give adenosine or achieve maximal hyperemia there is nothing called resting ffr you can do a basal pd by pa FFR by definition requires maximum hyperemic flow as you would have already seen from Dr. Ajay, uh, Ajay's slide, the first slide, the true definition of FFR is maximum achievable flow. So by definition, you should have a maximum flow or you should give hyperemia. So average by PD by PA over the entire cycle. Whereas an IFR, it's the average PD by PA over the diastolic wave free period, which is what I was referring to earlier. In RFR, what they do is that it's the lowest sub-cycle PD by PA, which is calculated as a moving average. Now, I'll tell you how it is calculated. Now, this is PA, that is red. PD is green. The broken line sells the average PD by PA, which is which measured during diastolic gives rise to the FFR. The software is actually capable of measuring it every instant. That is called the instantaneous PD by PA. The filter is supplied, and the lowest sub-cycle PD by PA over five beats is taken and shown on the screen. And by doing so, what they find is that approximately 12.2% of the cases of lowest PD by PA happen not in diastole, which is the usual thing for non-hyperemic pressure indices, but outside of diastole. That is, it can happen in systole as well. Now, this has been validated against IFR in the validate IFR trial. As can be seen, the, it has got fairly good accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity compared to IFR. It has been validated in other uh, trials as well, IRIS-FFR, 
Illumin 1 pred predict analysis, the validate I have already referred to as well as the revalidate trial. The IRIS FFR registry was an independent registry from Korea, which, which in which 30 centers participated. It's a good one to see how your lesions are going to respond once you defer these lesions based on RFR. In IFR, IRIS FFR registry, they did uh, FFR to all the patients, and then the patients were deferred based on an FFR measure. And offline, they measured the resting PD by PA, IFR, DPR, RFR, and DFR. And then they followed up these patients and they found that the deferred lesion failure rate based on an FF, uh, based on an FFR based strategy is exactly similar to the other resting, resting index based strategies as well. And all of them had the same cutoff point of 0.89. So that means that there is nothing sacrosanct about IFR. You can use any of the diastolic indices and all of them are probably non inferior to FFR. This was further, uh, further shown in the uh, 3V friend study where it can be seen that the estimated two year vessel oriented composite outcomes was also quite similar. The latest of the literature, the real world validation of the non hyperemic pressure index of uh, pressure index of rest uh, revalidate data again show that compared to IFR, it has the same diagnostic accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value as well as negative predictive value. I'll be happy to take questions because I'm sure that there will be many questions. Um, Thank you for the time. Thanks, Rajesh. It's an excellent talk. You, you are well ahead of time. I think you're finished in 7.5 7 minutes. Yeah. So yeah. any, yeah. Oh, what do you, Rajesh, one uh, clinical question. So suppose you have both FFR and all the resting indices with you. Do you still uh, do FFR in some cases or go only for resting indices, which is your preference? Or when you do resting indices, or what are the cases you prefer to do uh, hyperemic indices? Which I, I was expecting this question, and I actually I wanted the discussion to happen. That's why I stopped in 7.5 minutes. Uh, see, uh, it's about what you believe in. Uh, see, we all take patients to cath lab based on a TMT or a stress test. So stress test is what you are trained to do. That's what your cardiologists are used to do. If you believe in a stress test outside of the cath lab, you should also be believing in a stress test inside of the cath lab. So that means adenosine is actually stress test inside of the cath lab. So uh, now that this newer indices have come, it's about how what you believe in. In our lab, we actually do RFR for all because it's just like a flick of your iPad where you can measure it quite easily. And then give uh, uh, FFR and all our decisions are still based on FFR because we believe in a stress test outside as well as inside of the cath lab. But having said that, there is enough literature to tell us that IFR guided strategy is non-inferior to FFR. If people who are skeptical, we can also do a, something called a hybrid strategy where you can have a, a, a resting index measure, you have an FFR, say an RFR value of between 0 0.86 to 0 0.92, and you give adenosine and then uh, measure the FFR and you can dis dis decide based on your FFR if you are still skeptical. In that case also, you will be able to avoid adenosine at approximately 60% of the time, which is the latest literature. Uh, I think the recommendation, uh, can I? Yes, sir. Uh, the standard recommendation for these resting ratios is that if it is more than 0.93, it is true. And if it is less than 0.86, then again, it is probably significant, certainly. But I think they recommend between 8.6 and 9.2 to have a second uh, test like a FFR, like a uh, yeah. maximum hyperemic test. Is that no, that, that was, no, sir. That was actually the, earlier that was practiced. But after the defined ah. flare as well as this thing, they came okay. and they have come down to this cut, cutoff point of 0.89. So, so you have a clear cutoff, you say now. 0.89 and that's exactly, exactly sir. Yeah, because that's what we used to follow earlier. So maybe this yeah. is the, that's okay. still relevant, sir. Actually, like uh, if you are, yeah, that's pretty practical, I would say. Because exactly, you know, you exactly. Yeah, that. that's very practical. Yeah. Because in real yeah. life, what happens is you cannot sort of replicate a trial result exactly. Exactly, sir. So exactly. You want to make a decision which is more consolidated, more uh, realistic. Uh, my only one point is that this is uh, this I am throwing a question to everyone, all of you who are experts here. You know, when you do these studies and you put a wire across moderate lesions, be it RFR, IFR, FFR, whatever, 
you put a wire across and then you pulled it out saying that no, the lesion is not significant. Are there any studies to tell us that a lesion which has been wired and not done versus a lesion which has not been touched, uh, is there a difference in outcome? Because, you know, when you put a wire, there is a possibility that you will, uh, there could be, you could touch some plaque or something. So this is a inherent fear. Uh, I don't know. This is my own uh, thing that I'm saying. Uh, I'd like to have thoughts from the experts. So is there any fear that uh, you could uh, increase the lesion? Because I have uh, anecdotal examples where I left the lesion and the angina continued or whatever. There were some symptoms. And then uh, six months down the line, I was uh, forced to do that. Any experience, uh, Ajay or... Uh, uh, and, and, sir, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sir, Ajay, uh, do you uh, want to take this question? Or uh, Rajesh? I, I just want to comment about uh, there is a difference between the outcome is those who present with acute coronary syndrome versus chronic stable angina. The FAME trial has shown the five-year outcome quite no, favorable that's... for those who, who have been deferred. While those with acute coronary syndrome, the uh, outcome is not so favorable. So it's very likely that patients with acute coronary syndrome, something like ulcerative plaque, uh, which of course turn out to be insignificant with the FFR or RFR value, uh, turn out to be significant at six months down the line. So that's that's the difference, how the uh, how the individual plaque is going to behave, whether it's uh, uh, something which is unstable, may progress uh, very fast vis-a-vis -vis, uh, those in the PIM trial with the stable coronary syndrome do well, even at the five-year follow. Uh, on an average, what the literature do show about is that there is a two-fold increase in the maze rate uh, in those with acute coronary syndrome who has been deferred on the on the basis of the FFR vis-a-vis -vis, uh, those with a chronic stable angina patient. So that may be the possible reason for having uh, the maze uh, at short term of follow-up uh, uh, instead of, say, wire uh, creating the problem uh, in crossing the lesions. Uh, am I yeah, audible, sir? Yeah, Dr. Who? Ajay? This is Dr. Ajay Swami speaking. I think it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a very interesting point. However, there is large, there are three issues involved, sir. There is large amount of data to show that the wire itself does not produce any problem unless it causes a dissection in a tortuous or, um, um, you know, some uh, lesion which is uh, well, difficult to cross. Well, whatever it is when you are doing wiring a lesion, something can happen. I mean, it's not a true dissection, but I'm just talking in general, you know, some percentage of patients, maybe even 5% if they increase. Uh, that's what I'm trying to I think to it's an interesting hypothesis that by interrogating with the wire, we are actually, uh, you know, making the lesion yes. more unstable than it already is. It's an interesting hypothesis, but there isn't much evidence one way or the other. The closest yes. evidence we get is from the... Um, combined Dr. Elvin KD study in which they have actually done FFR and shown that OCT, which is an even more invasive technique if one looks at it objectively, was associated with, uh, you know, greater, uh, how do we say, adverse events down the line. And in fact, one of the editorials has mentioned that probably interrogating uh, uh, I mean, intermediate lesion with an OCT, whether there is some well, sir, uh, the line it's to associated with it. No, so it's an interesting hypothesis, but there isn't much data. About yeah, it. Well, this is a thought. I, I think we can summarize it saying that there, this is a thought. There could be some downside, not very uh, big, but one has to really think about it in practical terms when one is deciding on these technologies uh, and uh, leaving them uh, on a lesion which is uh, looking otherwise okay, but yes, the, the FFR or IFR has come. In the uh, not thank you, effect. thank you so much, sir. Great comments, sir. Yeah. And and uh, I think we are running 25 minutes short of time. We'll shall we move so, ahead? Sure. And thank sure. you so much, all for all the faculties uh, and actively participated in this thing. And thank you so thank much. You. Again. Thanks for the move hard for the next session. So, uh, let me invite uh, Dr. Deepak Davidson, Dr. Vijay Kumar, and Dr. Sandeep Mishra as a chairperson for the next session. And then panelists uh, Recording are stopped. Dr. Sudhir uh, Kognati, Dr. Prabhu Alkati, and Dr. Aditya Kapoor. Well, good, good afternoon to all of you. 
uh, uh, thanking Dr. Rajesh, Dr. Vijay Kumar and team for uh, this wonderful sessions today. Uh, well, it's my pleasant privilege to be here with you all. Now from fundamental, fundamentals, we'll move on to the more interesting things, the basics, we'll see more of cases. Uh, already we are late by almost 20, 25 minutes. So let me request all the speakers to stick on to the time, maybe eight minutes or 10 minutes of talk, and then probably we'll have at least around four to five minutes of discussion. Uh, the first presentation by Dr. Selvamani on MLD Max. We know that uh, during imaging, what all needs to be evaluated, we need to always have a uh, pre angioplasty run, that is, you need to strategize how you're going to do the lesion, uh, how you are going to manage the stenosis, and post-procedure, you need to have a uh, optimization too. So we'll go through MLD Max from Dr. Selmani. Please go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajesh and uh, Vijay and the entire uh, APCA team there. And uh, yesterday also it was good, and today it's a nice session going on, very interesting basic uh, uh, discussions. And uh, I'll just take probably 10 minutes, try to finish, uh, let us see, as Deepak requested. So coming to OCT, MLD Max, uh, basically this is how you uh, connect your uh, OCT machine, uh, connect your syringe, purge the catheter, drape it, and then go to the uh, dock and connect it up. So four important points that you should be remembering is the four P's. One is position the catheter, the lens marker distal to your lesion. You punch the catheter, you purge it through the small syringe here, which is connected to the uh, side of the uh, catheter. Give a puff in the, la <clears throat> in the guide to make sure there's a good clearance. And then you go and do a pullback and uh, do an imaging. Generally in OCT, we have two types of pullbacks. One is the survey mode, which runs for 75 millimeter and it takes lesser time. And high resolution acquisition, it runs for 54 millimeter, it takes more time. And then uh, these are the number of frames which is there. Basically, survey mode is for any lesion. And if you're interested in certain areas like bifurcation or stent fracture, probably you go for high resolution acquisition. That is how we go there. In the OCT catheter, it is like this. From the monorail tip to the lens marker, it is 27 millimeter. From the lens marker to the proximal, it is the proximal marker is 54 millimeter. And the entire survey mode is 75 millimeter. So this is how the catheter is divided. Just remember this as a basic. And of course, the uh, user interfaces are these things which you can measure. This we call, uh, this is for area, length, and then uh, this is the longitudinal view. This is the shortcut, uh, the short axis or the cut we have. And this is the angio core registration. And uh, this is the lumen profile, which we call it as. And after that, we have angio core registration, 3D bifurcation, 3D navigation. These are the general modes you should be familiar with in a OCT mission. See, coming to morphology, MLD and MA Max, it is basically for before stenting, you look at MLD now. So morphology, you are all familiar. The arteries are in three layers. That is the intima, the media, and the adventitia. So the media is a darker area here. This is how it looks on an OCT. So this is very, very important. The outer layer of the media is called the external elastic membrane, which we are really concerned about, which is very important You try to look into that. And whenever to interpret a lesion, you just make out whether you can see the EL and the adventitia very clearly. If you are able to see that, usually that is a normal artery or it's only a fibrous block. If you cannot see an EL or adventitia properly, probably you will have to change, see what is happening there. If the change in the signal, it is in the wall, whether if it is high attenuation, it is called a slipid, it is the lipid, low is calcium. And if the uh, defect is in the lumen, either it is a red thrombus or a white thrombus. What, how we differentiate is, if you can look at the back of the lesion, then it is a white thrombus. Similarly, if you look, can look at the back of the lesion, it is a calcium. So this is how we differentiate. We'll just see the images. So this is a normal fibrous atria. You see all the three layers there. And then this is a fibrous block here. This is a fibrous block. You'll see the EL here. The external elastic membrane is well, well seen there. But there is some amount of luminal narrowing with a block burden here, which is predominantly fibrous. Look at this uh, uh, part here. 
if this is fibrous, but beyond here, you are unable to see anything. You can't see the EL, there is no adventitia, and you cannot see the border at all. So this, we call it as eye attenuation, when you cannot see the behind of this lesion. So this is what how with the lipid looks like. So this is a lipidic lesion. In contrary, you see it, you can see the back of this lesion. So if you have something like this, so it is the calcific lesion, the calcium looks like this on an OCT. So basically even here, you cannot see the EL there, adventitia not clearly seen. Even here, you cannot see that. But if it is, if you are able to see the behind of the lesion, you call it as a calcium there. And if there is a defect in the lumen, if you cannot see the back here, you, you, you can, because of eye attenuation, you call it as red thrombus. And if you're able to see the entire part of the uh, thrombus here, which is a white thrombus. So luminal defect, it is thrombus. Wall, it is basically either it is calcium or lipid or fibers. Morphology, how does it help in, lesion, uh, in preparing the lesion? If it is lipidemic, it is recommended probably you can do a direct stenting there. And then if it is only fibrotic, complaint balloon or not, now NC balloon is sufficient. Moderate calcium, definitely you need a harder high pressure balloon like complaint balloon, an NC balloon or high pressure balloons. And severe calcium like this, probably you like to go for extra devices like IVL or atherectomy, whichever might be suitable. So calcium score is one important uh, morphology where you look into the uh, maximum angle of calcium. It, this is the circle where you decide, uh, you take that and give points there. If the angle more than 180, you give two points and maximum thickness compared to IVUS, uh, this is what happens. Like uh, you cannot uh, make out the thickness in IVUS, but here in OCT, you can clearly make out calcium length. You look into the longitudinal view. And if the score is more than four, it indicates probability of under expansion is high. Probably you'll have to use extra devices to get a better result. So this is an example you see here. This is the IVUS image of a calcium. And this image and this image almost looks the same on an IVUS. But when you do an OCT, you see it's a very thin layer of calcium. It might break with just balloon. But here it is a very thick layer of calcium. Probably you need some extra uh, devices or you'll have to be careful that probably it's a very thick calcium there. That is how you differentiate the thickness between the IVUS and OCT. Coming to length, it is very, very important to decide your uh, uh, length of a stent, how you do is, we generally plan to land in normal to normal segment. Just look into the uh, lumen profile here. It shows just the stenotic area. Probably these are the normal area. Very quick, you can do it. And uh, you just go to take the cursor here and then look into the wall characteristic. So if you can see the three layers here, probably this is a good layer. And coming to the distal segment also, you see here, you can see the three layers. So probably it is a normal uh, uh, vessel there. And then you look at the length. If it is 20 millimeter, you don't have a 20 millimeter stent. Probably you move your cursor a bit, a little bit, so that it matches to its length of your stent here. So here, uh, probably even here, it is a normal segment. And now we have a 24 millimeter stent and you can go ahead and deploy it. That is how you decide the stent. There are certain points which you should consider by uh, looking at the landing zone, which I will again highlight, but uh, try to get a place where there is no lipid burden block burden less than 50%. And uh, probably uh, that is what is very, very important in a diffusely diseased vessel. If you get a good three layers, that is excellent. And of course, angiocore registration is very important. You should go ahead about it. Looking at the diameter is also very, very important. How do you select the diameter of a stent? See, if you can see the EL, that is the best thing you can do. You take, this is the EL, EL to EL diameter. And if you're able to get it properly, you will have to probably, you can stent the size or more importantly, this is the size of your final NC balloon, which is very, very important. We tend to undersize by 0.25, go to the nearest size. For example, if it is 3.25, it can go to the three there. So, and if you are unable to get the yield, then you go by the lumen diameter. By the lumen diameter, you upsize by 0.25. That is what we do here. <clears throat> so, for example, in a case here, uh, where this is what is uh, we are demonstrating in the proximal segment, EL is 4.35, and uh, you will have to probably 3.6, you will have to undersize it to probably 4, 
and distal reference was around uh, uh, somewhere around 3, uh, 3.4. So we undersized to near 3 to the distal. So your uh, length of, you can decide the size of your stent as well as your NC balloon there. So if you follow this, what is the uh, chances of perforation is probably almost 0% in OCT and 0.7 in IVUS. So this is how we decide on the diameter. And coming to post stenting strategy, we'll have to look at the uh, max here, that is medial dissection, opposition and expansion. These are certain uh, uh, user interfaces, which I already told you, this is called a stent rendering and 3D by reconstruction, which you can reuse it to make out your uh, basic uh, 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 stenting strategy. So coming to medial dis dissections, there are different, it's very, very important. Many times OCT picks up small intimal dissections like this. So if it is like this, you need not do that. You need anything, you can just leave it like that. And very important is a dissection like this. It's a medial dissection where the dissection is extending into the media. And many times you can see the uh, dissection is extending into the media and there are hematomas present there. So these are the type of uh, the dissections that you should be very cautious. And stead edge dissections are uh, very, very important. And what dissections need to be treated is if the arc of a dissection is more than 60 degrees, length, you look into the longitudinal view for more than three millimeter, if there is significant intramural hematoma, inadequate lumen size, if the TIMI3 flow is less, and distal dissection is more important than proximal, medial dissection is what you should be aiming at, and you try to treat all these dissections. Coming to opposition, opposition is also important, but although there is not much of data uh, pointing towards mal opposition for producing uh, adverse event, but mal opposition, which is significant, which is longer than three millimeter, and there is more than three or four millimeter uh, gap between the vessel and the struts. It's a very important molar position which needs to be treated. Generally, for treating, we use a semi complaint balloon to correct molar position. See, on the OCT, we have a, a position indicator here that itself picks up if it is white at all the stented area, it is normal. So, if it is something red, that indicates that area there is significant molar position where which needs to be treated. The machine is designed like, if it is more than four millimeters, some machines more than three millimeters, you know, it comes as red there and it, it indicates a significant molar position. And you can look into the length here in the longitudinal view. If it's more than three millimeter, definitely you should go ahead and treat it with a balloon dilatation. Among everything, expansion is one important thing which determines long-term outcomes. And we know that all vessel is not the same, right? With the uh, Proximal, it is bigger. As we go down, it becomes narrower. So keeping this in mind, we look at the expansion limits there. We look at the reference diameter, especially the distal as well as the proximal. And then today's uh, ESC guideline says at least acceptable should be 80% of the reference diameter. Your stent, that is minimal stent area, should be at least more than 80%. And the optimal will be more than 90% compared to, to the reference uh, diameter. So to do that, what we do is, if it's in a long stent like this, you divide the stent into the two half here. This is the half here, this is the proximal. And then you compare the minimal stent area, automatically it comes here. And compared to the distal segment, the machine itself will tell you what is the percentage of expansion. Here, the distal is 87 and proximal is around 100% expansion there. And there's another way you can still go ahead and divide in two as a older system. Uh, and then look into the MSA and compare to the distal uh, diameter, which I'll show you a bit later. And then uh, these are some of the uh, example, I'll be a little bit faster. And once you know that that's the minimal stented area, uh, on angio core registration, it is automatically pointed. The yellow mark, what you see here, is the point of minimal stent area. You can just select it, uh, that area, take the required balloon dial diameter, Generally, what uh, balloon dilatation we do is we don't try to exceed the EL to EL diameter. For example, the EL, if it is somewhere around three here, don't exceed that diameter uh, so that you can avoid perforation. So to take that balloon size to the maximum of the EL and dilate in that area so that you will get an excellent stent expansion without any complications. And uh, look at this example. Look at this angiogram. This is post-stenting uh, 
angiogram. This patient had some problem, so we couldn't make out anything in angio. So imaging was done here. You compare this angiogram to what has happened here in imaging. So there is a significant uh, dissection there, and it's almost a, a major uh, dissection with some hematoma here. And in this tinted area, this patient has significant molar position here. And in this area, he has underexpansion. So in one patient where angiographically it looks everything normal, you have so much of problem there. So imaging is very, very important. This is a major dissection, major malaposition and a significant underexpansion. So this patient was corrected with another stent there to the distal dissection. Adequate expansion was done and it was a very good result there. Look at this uh, an example where in uh, anterior wall my patient undergoes uh, thrombosection here. And after thrombosection, this is the OCT here. So this patient has almost a diffuse disease. You look at the vessel here, in all the segment, there is disease, there is no normal segment at all. Very difficult to get an area which is uh, uh, less than uh, the, uh, uh, probably 50% plug burden. So wherever you see there is a plug, it's a fibrous plug, luckily here, there is not much of lipid here. But you can see the EL because it's a fibrous, you are able to see that. And in that, uh, there are areas of ruptures which we have seen in this uh, case here. And then uh, you come uh, to the next uh, uh, proximal segment. We, knew, we know that the EL, what it is. So this is the proximal landing zone which we have selected. And this is the maximum EL, and this is the maximum EL in the distal segment that we can go there. So what I have done is the distal always selected a plug burden which is less than 48%. Uh, uh, and then uh, this is how I have selected the distal zone. And if it is more than 50, better avoid that area. If you are unable to do it, probably you'll have to put one more stent and take a longer uh, uh, stent for a distant, uh, a long lesion coverage. And this is the angiogram. And first angiogram you see here, uh, we just look at the distal segment. There is no dissection. Then you go for the expansion of the stents there. There was some amount of protrusion like this, which we call it as plaque prolapse. If there is a tissue prolapse like this for more than 20%, if there is slow flow, probably you'll have to balloon it or do some other strategy. If it is a smaller prolapse like this, you can just ignore it and live it. And of course, you look for stent expansion here, almost 90% distally, 100% proximally. This is what uh, stent expansion we have got in this case. So always remember, try to get this excellent uh, stent expansion, at least 80% uh, from the reference area, and uh, no major dissections, plop uh, less than 60 degree, uh, and the medial dissection should not be there, land in the plop burden, which is less than 50%, and no lipid there, not much of excessive tissue prolapse there, and no significant molar position. This is the final uh, image, what you should always remember, try to achieve in all patients. And I think with this, generally what I do is, I do an angio co registration. Angiographically, I see that whether it is good or not. If there is any doubt, I go ahead and dilate with the balloon. Only if I'm finally satisfied with the angio, then I go with the OCT. If I'm reaching the criteria, then it is good. Otherwise, again, dilate up to the balloon to the EL size. Don't go beyond the EL size. And then sometimes, if the lumen is lesser, we might need an additional stent there and do a final imaging. Thank you very much for your uh, listening there. Dr. Selmani, thank you very much. It was a very informative talk. Uh, well, your passion for OCT, you don't even remember when you're supposed to stop. It's almost 20 minutes into the into the session, sir. Sir, I just okay. a quick question to you before we move on to the next talk. Uh, yeah. Regarding, you, let's say you have a very critical stenosis. Let's say 90, 99% stenosis of the left anterior distinct artery. You need to get the catheter across. You need to have a proper contrast flush. How do you decide on what balloon size are you going to dilate it with? Is it just a 2 millimeter balloon or is it a 2.5 millimeter balloon? And how what pressures do you open up so that you do not really disturb the lesion morphology before you take the catheter inside the vessel? And second question is, do you prefer using a uh, manual injection or an angiomat and what would be your flow rates? That's just basics on yeah, yeah. That's a very important uh, thing. If it is a very critical lesion, uh, we just cannot get a good blood clearance uh, for a OCT image to be acquired. And uh, most of the time, like uh, today, we don't bother because even we try to dilate with a two size balloon or a 2.5 size balloon. And then we take a OCT and then decide on 
our treatment strategies. And uh, as you rightly said, to make out whether it is a rupture or is it an erosion or in a patient with ISR uh, who has significant tight stenosis, what is the clock characteristic? It's very important. But I don't think it makes a big difference in your treatment modality or the final outcome. So if possible, we uh, probably a smaller size balloon is okay, but many times it may not be sufficient. Even if you take a bigger balloon, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change your treatment strategy. That is what I have observed. And uh, many times, uh, uh, nowadays we don't use manual injections. And uh, we have a, a power injector, which is automatically connected to our Cine pedal. The moment you do a Cine, automatically it injects. And uh, that is what uh, we have. And uh, but there are different rates that you can set depending upon the vessel size, whether you want to see the left main or whether you want to see the RCF, that can be done. And I think I'll have to just refer, I'm just remember, unable to recollect because it's all routinely done by the cat, uh, cat lab technician. I'm not remembering the flow rate exactly now. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, uh, uh, any, any other question from panelists? We can have one question at least. No, if there are no more questions, shall we move on to the next presentation by Dr. Raja on vessel preparation and stent sizing? Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Start my slideshow. Good afternoon, Dr. Everyone. Raja. Dr. Raja, let me just remind you to kindly stick on to your time. Yes, I will try my best. Uh, so my topic is uh, vessel preparation and uh, sizing of the stent to have good outcomes. So historically, pre-dilatation as a lesion preparation was mandatory to facilitate the positioning of the stent delivery system, which in the beginning was quite bulky and thick. With decreased track thickness and dimensions of stent delivery systems together, with improved radial force of these modern drug eluting stents, direct stenting without P dilatation became widely applied. But the treatment of more complex stenosis like fibrotic, calcified, long diffuse diseases still led to stent failures, which were later realized. So these are some of the factors which lead to stent failure, the biological factors, technical factors, and mechanical factors. So the technical factors can be dealt with or fixed in part or whole by adequate vessel preparation. So uh, what is vessel preparation? So before stenting, we need to know the morphology and that is known initially from the coronary angiogram. So this is the basic angiogram which we do every day and nothing compares to have a good idea and knowledge of reading a angiogram in all orthogonal views and then proceed with imaging as and when required. So, Today we have intracoronary imaging and it has told us a lot about, a lot more about the coronary anatomy than simple luminograms. So it, uh, if we do a proper vessel preparation, it increases the lesion compliance, improves stent and device delivery, facilitates optimal stent expansion and the luminal gain, which reduces the TLR rates, reduces edge dissections, reduces malapposition, and makes the procedure easier and potentially less traumatic to the vessel wall. Intracoronary imaging also provides information on the lesion composition, that is what the morphology is, pathology, the lesion dimensions, the diameter and the length accurately, lesion distribution, vessel size, lesion preparation length, and goal-oriented control of lesion preparation and stent implant result. And these today can be achieved by either IVAS or OCT. So this is an example of uh, uh, direct stenting in a patient with uh, NC balloon uh, later post dilated to 23 atmospheres, but it did not give uh, a good result. So these are uh, images, uh, comparison of uh, IVAS versus uh, OCT of deep calcium and superficial calcium. As my previous speakers have already shown that OCT is a much better tool to identify calcium than IVAS. So this is uh, the rates of uh, you know, stent expansion at 16 atmosphere and the arc of calcium. As the arc of calcium uh, increases from 50 to 200, 250, 300 or 360 degrees, the stent expansion even at 16 atmospheres is less than almost uh, 60%. So ideally, my previous speaker has already shown 
it should be more than 80% and it's still better optimal is more than 90%. Coronary calcium index is an independent predictor of worse prognosis. We all know that calcium uh, does not lead to a good stem opposition or expansion and also uh, reduces the efficient, uh, efficiency of the drug delivery coating on the stem. This is a meta-analysis on the impact of severely calcified lesions on patient outcomes across seven contemporary PCI studies. With severe calcification, you can see the mortality is significant to the tune of 10.8%. So this is again a, a, a graph diagram from Horizons AMI and acute coronary calcium scores of complex intervention with higher risk of complication and PCI failure with severe calcium. The red uh, towers are the uh, patients who had severe calcium and the gray towers are none or mild calcium. Like you can see, the incidence of death, cardiac death, MI, TLR, or MACE were all significantly more with patients who had severe calcium. So even at two years, uh, the target vessel failure was 16.4% versus 9.8% in patients who had severe calcium versus patients who did not have more severe calcification. So these are, what are the tools we have in hand to prepare the vessel? So. We have in hand uh, uh, NC balloon, a cutting balloon, scoring balloon. Now we have lithotipsy, a laser, rotational atherectomy, or orbital atherectomy. So these tools are very helpful in preparing the lesion and uh, uh, allowing us to adequately position a stent and expand it to avoid uh, uh, and reduce the rates of TLR. So this is an example uh, of an atherotom balloon. This is a cutting balloon angioplasty in a porcine. Uh, pig model. So, like we can see, atherotom creates microsurgical incisions in this vessel wall, and change in lesion compliance can then be achieved at even lower pressures of stent expansion. This is again a cutting balloon, the atherotomes, which uh, makes uh, beautiful cuts, and these images can be seen beautifully on OCT images. So, this is again an angio sculpt with uh, wires uh, wound across uh, the balloon, and uh, this has minimal slippage, more dilatation force and low dissection rates. This is an uh, example of scoring balloon and showing uh, subsequent OCT images. So what happens with uh, a cutting balloon? The post-procedure MLA can be achieved more, and there is uh, adequate luminal gain to have good outcomes. So this is, again, a, a graph showing a stent expansion by plaque. In the calcified plaque, pre-dilatation with uh, NGO sculpt showed uh, around 90% stent expansion. P dilatation with COBA on the other end showed only 75% stent expansion, and direct stenting was also 72%. So, when we do adequate lesion preparation by cutting balloon or NGO sculpt, we have adequate stent expansion leading to less TLR. So, this is uh, a newer technology which we have been using frequently now. Uh, lithotripsy balloon, and which, uh, in which contains a balloon with emitters at the source of uh, sonic pressure waves emitted at one pulse per second for one microsecond. So these uh, lithotripsy balloons can be inflated at low pressures up to four atmospheres, and then the shocks can be delivered, and which gives very good uh, calcium cuts even in deep uh, in patients who have deep calcium and not only in superficial calcium. This has to be done one is to one sizing. Uh, we inflate at four atmospheres, pulse it, and then deflate. Uh, then pulse and inflate again and then deflate and then we see for the final result. Uh, it is very important for lithotripsy balloons to be size one is to one, otherwise there will be a gap between the balloon layers and the uh, intimal wall and which in, in which case the lithotripsy shocks will not be effective. So uh, in vessel preparation, the optimal lesion preparation has gained or regained increased attention not only during the era of uh, scaffold implantation. There is a large toolbox now with devices for optimal lesion preparation beyond POBA, in particular for calcified lesions. It also facilitates stent implantation and improves acute and long term results. Intracoronary image guidance with contemporary NGO co registration is a supportive tool for optimal lesion preparation. With that, I will proceed to the stent sizing if I have time. Uh, uh, most of uh, my uh, topic in uh, stent sizing have already been covered by my previous speakers. This can be done in seven steps, like pre-intervention, st uh, during the intervention, post-stent deployment, and after 
uh, the results. So basically, the normal arterial topography we all know is uh, shown beautifully in uh, OCT images. And this OCT image interpretation has to be done very carefully. And uh, we should be able to see all the three layers that like the previous speaker has already shown. And these are uh, the same slides which I am repeating at the risk of repeat. I will skip these slides. And again, uh, there are these limitations of angiography when we cannot, uh, on angiography, we do not see any calcium, but on uh, trying to balloon pre dilate, we cannot dilate that because it is undilatable. So in uh, angiographically also, we might have a protruding calcific nodule which may be seen on a intracoronary imaging. An influence of calcium on stent expansion by OCT has already been spoken about. Uh, we should always identify reference segments proximal and distal and choose stent length accordingly. Choose the stent diameter, uh, downsize if it is EL to EL and upsize if it is lumen to lumen. Uh, we have automated measures in OCT, which helps us um, see. I'll just skip those slides. So we need to identify stent problems post stenting and post dilatation. And these are some of the problems we come across. Uh, malopposition, under expansion, tissue protrusion, or dissections. So we have a position indicator, which always uh, is a helpful tool uh, by doing OCT. And these are the events related to acute stent malopposition. The stand bag has shown at least 10.7% mace incidence in uh, no acute malaposition. In acute malaposition, it was 8.2%. So we need to also identify tissue protrusion. If it is uh, more than 10%, then it is major. If it is less than 10%, it is minor and can be left alone. And then we need to look at both the edges proximal and distal. And if the uh, arc is more, we need to put in another stand and cover up the dissection. So these are the clinical outcomes at one year of May's target vessel failure, death, myocardial infarction, and stent thrombosis in patients who had dissection versus no dissection. Thank you. I'll end up there. I hope I've finished in time. Yeah, Raja, you've, uh, you've finished well ahead of time. Thank you. Uh, just two quick questions. Uh, it was a very informative talk. Now, uh, this, the decision regarding whether you need to do an uh, you need to do an imaging prior to every every angioplasty every stenting procedure. Uh, just wanted to know your experience. How often would you go ahead and do an imaging to decide on debulking strategy or lesion preparation strategy? That's question number one. And question number two: When you have some lesion with very severe calcification. You are sure that the imaging catheter is not going to cross the lesion. So you go ahead with rotablation, prepare the lesion, and then would you go ahead with non-compliant balloon or angioscalp, angiosco, things like that? Or would you, following rota, would you go ahead, do an imaging, then decide on what should be your next treatment strategy? So uh, answering your first part of the question, I do not think, and I do not do also, that every angiogram does not need imaging. So it, it, it would be utopian to think that we could be able to do uh, intracoronary imaging in all patients. There are situations, uh, in selective situations, we need to do intracoronary imaging. Intracoronary imaging definitely helps to better outcomes. Uh, but uh, a, a person who, uh, I mean, a physician who is not able to uh, read the plain coronary angiogram properly will not be able to identify even in the intracoronary angiogram, I believe that. So having said that, if the uh, uh, coronary angiogram, the invasive coronary angiogram shows us uh, there are uh, issues where we need to do uh, intracoronary imaging, and that can be many, like uh, if it is an ambiguous lesion, if it is a uh, uh, doubtful lesion, if it is uh, calcified, those uh, minor things can always be picked up from angiogram. Now, if we have all not decided to do an intracoronary imaging and we proceed and then face the problem, we can always go back and do a uh, intracoronary angiogram even after doing a balloon or trying to balloon if the balloon does not inflate my dictum or my uh, practice is to go ahead uh, with the nc balloon and then try to inflate it if it does not give at high pressures in two orthogonal views i think i'm dealing with something sinister and then i might need uh, uh, better tools like intracoronary imaging along with a cutting balloon uh, lithotripsy or maybe a rotablator Thank you. Thank you, Raja. Uh, are there any questions from the uh, other panelists? If not, we'll move on to Dr. Vijay Kumar's talk.
Vijay, please go ahead. Vijay, you have your mic is muted. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, clear. Uh, sorry, I think most of the things have been uh, concerned with this talk have been discussed already. Uh, I thought maybe I'll just go through some of the basic aspects and uh, some case examples here. So start with some basics. There are two types of calcification, as we all know. One is your uh, calcium type uh, plate type. And the second one is your nodular type. This is a classification based on your shape. And uh, based on your location, your calcium can be either superficial, which is closer to your lumen, or deep, which is closer to your adventitia. And we all know it is a superficial calcium, which is the greatest enemy of interventional cardiologists. So that is the one that resulted in underextend, underexpansion. Deep calcium, you can do a routine balloon angioplasty and get away with a good stent expansion. And based on the distribution along the circumference, it can be either concentric, which is more than 180 degree along the circumference, or eccentric when it is 180 degree or less. And the nodular calcification, again, of two types. One is your nodular protrusion. That is nothing but protrusion with intact smooth surface on the lumen side. Or eruptive nodule, which is a dense eruptive calcified mass with an irregular surface. More often, it is a breach in the intimal surface and with attached thrombus. So these are the basic types of calcification. What is the role of imaging in calcified intervention? Again, everything has been discussed already. To reinforce the pre-intervention, it decides, helps you in identifying who needs atherectomy during intervention. It tells you whether you have adequately prepared the lesion and whether you can safely upsize your bar and post-intervention, it helps in stent optimization. Because again, it has been already discussed. Ivers identify calcium by hyperechoic block shadowing and reverberation. OCT, it is a heterogeneous block with pencil line borders. That is how you identify calcium. And there are three important parameters. One is the length of the calcium, both IVS and OCT shows you. And second one is arc of calcium, again, both IVS and OCT shows you. And third important parameter is the thickness that because the OCT a light can pass through your calcification, you can identify calcium thickness only with OCT, not with IVS. Based on the three parameters, these three parameters, there is a calcium score that has been already discussed by Dr. Selvamani. And when your score is three or four, you need an atherectomy based strategy. And what about comparison between angiography, OCT, and IVUS? Comparing to angiography, both OCT and IVUS detect more calcium. But between these two, IVUS detects more calcium than OCT because of this depth penetration. Another important observation from this study, as we all know, we cannot detect the thickness of the calcium with IVUS. What are the indirect, indirect uh, markers of thin calcium? One is if we don't see calcium angiographically and see only with IVUS, that is a thin calcium. And second, if your calcium surface is smooth, it is again a thin calcium. And if you see reverberation, again, it is a thin calcium. These are the three predictor of thin calcium by IVUS if you don't have an OCT. And go through some of the key scenarios here. Start with a thin superficial eccentric calcium. When your calcium thickness is less than 500 and it is even it is eccentric, balloon dilatation breaks the calcium plate and stent expands normally. This is an example here. You can just see a thin calcium with a reverberation here and routine balloon dilatation. And here you can just see stent expands optimally. The second scenario, again, you have eccentric calcium, but here your thickness is more than 500 microns. Here, the balloon dilatation does not modify the calcium per se, but instead it, on, it modifies a non-calcified segment of the vessel. And your stent expansion depends on what is the amount of increase in the vessel compliance, which it depends on dissection of the non-calcified part of the vessel and dissection around the calcium plate. Stent usually expands in a D-shaped fashion and with smaller position at the edges. That is what, what you get. You have a thin eccentric calcium. Sorry, here. And suppose you, when do you get a circumferential expansion when you have an eccentric calcification? Whenever your preparation is very extensive and you just lifted the calcium plate from your vessel wall surface, that is when you get a, a circumferential stent expansion. Okay, when you have a thin eccentric calcium, how does the rotational atherectomy works? 
when your wire bias, it all depends on how your wire bias towards are away from the calcium. And if you have an unfavorable bias that is evidenced by your imaging catheter away from your calcium, and the calcium plate is uh, largely unaffected, it may result in damage to the non-calcified normal part of the vessel and can be uh, predicted with the position of your imaging catheter. And when you have a thick eccentric calcium, if you have a favorable wire bias, that means imaging catheter is a closer to your calcified plate and your burr is highly likely to ablate this calcium and make it thin, it may respond to with the optimal stand expansion. So this is an example of a thick superficial calcium here. Just see this is a patient, you can just see here thick and long extensive long segment eccentric calcification on angiography. So we did an OCT imaging. Here you can just see the calcium is about 180 degrees and other part of the vessel was normal. And uh, as we already mentioned here, you just see that imaging catheter is away from your calcification. And we did a, a rotational atherectomy with 1.5 bar, post dilatation with a 2.5, NC balloon here. And as we expected, there is no change in the calcium here. Calcium remains intact here. All the modification has happened in the normal part of the vessel at, and at the junction of the, where there is a change in the compliant at the junction of calcium with the normal vessel. We went ahead, put a stent and post dilated. This is a final angiogram. This is what we got with OCT as we already mentioned, D-shaped expansion of the stent with the molar position at the edges. This is what you get when your calcium is not yielding and you don't get an, any extensive dissection around the calcification. And you don't, you should not be just aiming for a circular uh, lumen and uh, trying to post dilate it further that may interrupt with vessel rupture. And here is another example here. You get an old man, tight calcific stenosis here and then an extensive, extensive calcification on the septal side. Okay, just see that what happens. We dilate. We use a 1.25 burr. You just see that the burr is going away from your calcification. We all know this is going to happen, but here the aim is to just ablate the critical part of the calcium rather than this eccentric calcification. So what we did here, just see that, and we dilated with a two, two millimeter balloon, 2.5 millimeter, and just the gradual escalation of your balloon dilatation. And this is uh, what we got, extensive dissection, and uh, so this is what you get after uh, optimal lesion preparation. If you get this type of appearance, we are happy. We are going to get a good amount of stent expansion in eccentric calcification. That is what we saw in IVAS. You can just see that this is your calcium plaque. Nothing has happened to the calcium plaque, but there is extensive dissection all around the calcium plaque and the normal part of the vessel. See, we went ahead and put a 2.534 stent. Just see that and post dilated and this is what uh, we got so you just see that very good uh, lumen uh, at least angiographically so what we got in i was this is what i was mentioning if you lift the calcium plate from the vessel wall and that you get a beautiful circular stent expansion so this is an example of uh, eccentric calcification and where you had a lesion preparation that resulted in the lifting of calcium plate from your vessel wall that resulted in circular stent expansion. And when you then now move on to concentric calcification, this is an example scenario of a thin superficial concentric calcification. That means calcium is more than 180 degrees and your plate thickness is less than one, uh, less than 500 microns. So this usually expand with your NC balloon dilatation and you get a good stent expansion with this thing, okay? And uh, this is an example here, 270 calcification and a good calcium fracture here and round stent expansion. And what happens if you have a thick calcification, thick concentric calcification, that means uh, more than 180 degrees and more than 0.5 millimeter in thickness, we're able to pass an IVL, that is the best treatment here. So what happens here, IVL results in multiple calcium fractures that you just see that it, it extends in depth and wide open fractures. That is what you get with IVL and you get a beautiful stent expansion. And what happens, is, suppose you're not able to pass rotational atherectomy and uh, you do, sorry, able to pass IVL, you have to do a rotational atherectomy. And uh, 
the atherectomy increases the lumen size uh, to uh, the, the size of the rotational atherectomy. And uh, then you do your IVL or non compliant or cutting balloon dilatation that results in calcium fracture that results in optimal stent expansion. Your stent expansion here depends on whether you are fractured or not. And whether when you are fractured, more the number of fracture, better will be your stent expansion. And when you have a two, uh, thick superficial calcification and your lumen is big, but still you are doing a rotational atherectomy. What happens here? The rather bar goes eccentrically, make the calcium thin eccentrically. And when you do additional balloon dilatation, the calcium fracture and stent expands optimally. This is how the lesion responds to rotational atherectomy. Okay, so we move forward. This is an example, a patient with extensive uh, calcification, anomalous RCA, engaged with a JL guiding, and ablation with one fiber, and dilated with NC balloon. Here you see that you got a calcium fracture in some areas, but you see most some of the areas still very thick calcium, thick and intact calcium. This is when you go and put your stain, you resulted in underexpanded stain. So these two areas, almost 360 degree calcium and absolutely no fracture with your non-compliant balloon. Here you can see a fracture, here you can see a fracture, but these two areas, there is no fracture. What we did and use a guidezilla, put a shock wave balloon three, five into 12. And this is what we got after shock wave balloon. You can just see the same two areas. We got a wide open fractures here. This is what you get with uh, your shock wave balloon. The so hope went ahead, uh, put a design stand and just expanded. So this is what uh, we got to finally well expanded stands after your IVL. And finally, what about nodular calcification? And uh, uh, what about rotational atherectomy here? The rotational atherectomy just uh, saves the top of the calcium depending on the wire bias. And it may require a step of burr. This is one situation where one burr is not enough. You have to step up to bigger burrs. Maybe if you, if you have one, you may end up using two, two, five and two, two, five burrs. But I, I don't think we have it in India. We tried maximum using two millimeter burrs. And one additional thing we can, people say that uh, orbital atherectomy results in better ablation because uh, the, when you increase the uh, uh, speed of the orbital atherectomy, more shaving of this the calcium happens. So the more thinning uh, may get a better stent expansion with orbital atherectomy. This is an example of uh, multiple nodal calcification. We did with the uh, one, two fiber, and what's well, sorry, one fiber dilated and still there is uh, a lot of uh, protrusion remaining all over. And after this imaging went ahead with the uh, one seven fiber. This is what we got after one seven fiber and uh, aggressive preparation with angioscal conforming in two views for optimal balloon expansion. And this is what we got an extensive dissection and uh, more lumen area following one seven five and balloon dilatation and the two drug eluting stents optimized with a four millimeter balloon. Still you have a uh, under expanded stent here and went ahead with the dilated with the four five balloon and uh, well expanded stent with lumen area of uh, minimal lumen area of 9.5 millimeter square. So you have to use multiple strategies and aggressive balloon dilatation to get uh, stent expansion. So to summarize, when you see angiographically moderate or severe calcification, if intravascular imaging is feasible, find out whether it is a nodular or plate calcium. Calcium. If it is nodular calcium, use orbital or rotational atherectomy to shave up as much calcium as possible, then follow with the balloon stage strategy. And if it is plate calcium, see the score zero to two balloon-based strategy, three to four, if you're able to pass IVL balloon, that is a treatment of choice, if you are not able to pass IV balloon to rotational atherectomy, then balloon-based strategy, and can always confirm uh, calcium fractures, particularly multiple fractures predict good extent expansion. After standing, always confirm uh, whether the stent is optimally expanded. So to conclude, coronary ossification remains the main determinant of optimal stent expansion. Thinner calcium plates break easily with balloon dilatation alone. In case of thick eccentric calcium, stent expansion occurs from modification of non-calcified segment of the vessel. Response to atherectomy depends on wire bias. 
in case of thick cancer decalcification, atherectomy results in focal calcium thinning and then fracture with balloon dilatation. In case of nodular calcification, step up bar approach or orbital atherectomy is needed. Intravascular imaging helps in deciding need for atherectomy, response to it, and the need for need for and safety of bar upsizing and conforming stent expansion. Thanks for your patient listening. Vijay, Vijay, thanks for that masterly presentation and the wonderful cases. Just one quick question before we move on to Dr. Himanshu's lecture. Uh, we saw an anomalous RCA wherein you had the guide catheter floating inside the iota. How did you manage to get those wonderful OCT images? Did you manage to have a guide cilla inside the yeah, vessel? Yeah, all the images were acquired with guide cilla, so that's how we could get a good images of. Uh... And do you make any pressure modification while you use the angiomat with guide cilla? No, with this is all with the uh, hand injection, sir. Uh, Vijay, shall we move on to the next talk? Yeah, go ahead, sir. And Dr. Himanshu, please go ahead with your presentation, FFR and tandem lesions. Dr. Anil Dal and team, they've already joined the session because we are too much encroaching into the next session. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you so much to organizers of uh, the IPCI and Professor Rajesh and Dr. Vijay for this kind invitation to be part of this wonderful meeting. So I'll save some time because I have a short presentation because I'm not very experienced in using FFR now since my fellowship days, but now I don't use it too much. But uh, I've been given the talk uh, to talk about FFR in tandem lesion. So FFR, as we all know, that it's, it's one of the very important tools to decide whether a PCI should be done or not. FFR-based deferral for all stenosis has been conclusively proven by multiple RCTs and the famous FAME study that is safe and is better for our patients. But as in India, we see a lot of diffuse disease and in diffuse disease, sometimes it is very difficult decision. How long do we stand? Where do we stand? Which lesion do we do? And which, we leave, which lesion we, uh, we leave out? So FFR is one of the important tools in that. So the basic step of FFR will remain the same even in the tandem lesion. So tandem lesions will mean that we have a LED which has a proximal and a mid stenosis or a proximal and a distal stenosis. If we talk about FFR for left main and downstream disease into the LED and L6, that is a topic in itself altogether. So what we are discussing here is that when we have tandem lesions in the same artery, it's not a bifurcation, it's a same artery, whether it is LED, LCX or the RCA. So we place the sensor distal in the coronary artery as we do after uh, proper equalization and guide positioning. We rule out catheter damping, which can affect our first FFR reading. And then we induce maximum hyperemia with IV DNSN. So the important thing is that if we want to analyze FFR for tandem lesions, probably we should go for IV adenosine and not uh, intracoronary. Because intracoronary hyperemia, as we know, just lasts for a few seconds, 30 seconds at the most and then we run out of the hyperemia. So we don't have time for pullback. So in, in uh, doing FFR for tandem lesions, what we need is time to do a proper pullback. That is why we need good IV adenosine, maybe 140 microgram, or sometimes even 180 microgram per kg per minute if we are using a peripheral line. But if we are using a central line, that's 140 microgram per kg per minute. Then once we are sure that we've achieved good hyperemia, our sensor is distal, we need to pull the sensor slowly under fluoroscopy. Some of the cath lab softwares also have a, a, a software for uh, FFR co-registration, like we have for OCT co-registration and now with Sync Vision IVAS co-registration. So some of the labs also have FFR co-registration. So that is also very important. But we also need to be mindful where our lesions are on the angiogram. So we should know whenever a pressure transfusion is distal to a particular lesion, and then we slowly pull back at the same time, we should keep on looking at the FFR trait. So the individual contribution of every segment gets affected by the other. So if we have two tandem lesions, the distal will affect the FFR of the proximal and the proximal will affect the FFR of the distal because hyperemia is affected by the downstream lesion. So that is why it is very difficult to assess true contribution of tandem lesions as a whole. So single stenosis, as we know, is simple. We just have a gradient which immediately improves once we cross the lesion. But in tandem lesions, it becomes a little more difficult. So this is a coronary tree. You have a single lesion in the proximal LED. You have one FFR in the left main or in the ostium. 
and you have 75 readings in the mid LED. That means you can take it as 175. So the gradient across the legion A is 25. Whereas if you have two legions, serial stenosis like this, you have a serial stenosis A and you have a stenosis B. Then how to assess which one is more significant is sometimes what uh, you know uh, becomes a problem. So here you can, uh, what you can do is you, you uh, do your uh, equalization at the ostium. So that is 100. Then you go down distally. So most important is to first see whether the whole vessel is ischemic or not. So if the whole vessel is not ischemic, that is your distal transducer reading is more than 0 0.8, then that means that you don't need to analyze either of these lesions individually because the vessel is non-ischemic. So once the distal most FFR is less than 0 0.8, then you know that this vessel is ischemic. So what your endeavor now is to find out which of these two lesions is more of a contributor to this uh, vessel ischemia. So that is what is FFR in tandem lesion. So what you do is there are various ways where you can predict an FFR of a single lesion in tandem lesions also. But for that, you need uh, coronary wedge pressure. And for that, you need to occlude the coronary and then put a pressure transducer distally. So these are all very complicated uh, formulas, uh, which I don't think are practical to use. So what is practical to use is, so you just perform a pullback during steady state hyperemia, and then you see where is the maximum pressure jump. Wherever is the maximum pressure jump, you treat that lesion and you repeat the FFR. So if you see the pressure jump of 20 in one part and 10 in one part, so treat the part where the pressure jump is of 20, and then you repeat the FFR for the remaining lesions and then assess whether they need to be treated or not. This is the very, this is the only way you can do FFR for tandem lesion. So, so the pressure recording should be step by step and then we take a decision. So I'll come to two examples. These are not my cases, but uh, published cases. So you see this right coronary artery has two lesions in the proximal part and one in the distal part. The distal part, the lesion looks little more significant than the proximal one. So you do FFR for the vessel. So the FFR for the vessel is 0 0.34. That means this right coronary artery is ischemic. That means we need to treat. Now whether we need to treat both or one is the question. So you do an FFR. So you see a large gradient which steps up just proximal to the distal lesion. There is some step up of the proximal lesion also, but that step up is appreciably less than the step up that you see across the distal lesion. So what you do is you treat the distal lesion and then you repeat the FFR. You repeat the FFR again, it is 0 0.7. And again, you see a step up just at the proximal segment. Since the FFR is still less than 0 0.8, so you need to treat the other lesion also. So you treat the le both lesions and then the final FFR is non ischemic And this is an example where interpretation of the FFR has been done wrongly. Now you, you see this LED is very diffusely diseased from the proximal to the distal part. Visually, you believe that the proximal lesion must be significant. So an FFR has been done, which shows no significant step up. There is significant uh, ischemia in the vessel, but there is no one point step up of the vessel. So you see the green trace, it doesn't step up across one particular point. It's a diffuse uh, stenosis with a overall FFR of the vessel of 0 0.7. So the operator has treated the proximal LED, left the mid and the distal stenosis, repeats an FFR, it's again ischemic, then goes on to treat the second one, which is the distal and leaves the middle. Again, re uh, repeats the FFR, it's again ischemic, and then he treats the middle, and finally the FFR is non ischemic. So probably this is an example which shows how an FFR should not be used. In this case, the whole vessel is ischemic. You don't have a particular step up. So probably imaging would have been better to treat this vessel after an initial FFR rather than taking it as a case of tandem lesion. This is not tandem lesion. This is diffuse disease. Whether we can do this, whether it is safe to defer lesions based on FFR, there, there was this very nice study from two centers in Korea where they had the 141 arteries and a total of almost 300 stenosis. So out of 300 stenosis, tandem stenosis in 141 arteries, 182 out of these 300 stenosis were deferred based on FFR. And they had done mean follow-up of 501 days. And uh, the results were perfect. 
the deferred lesions did not have any acute MI. There was just one instant restenosis in the treated lesion, and there was no increase in death or non-fatal MI in in the deferred lesion. So the so to defer the lesion based on FFR is probably safe. So in the end, I'll just say that FFR is very important tool for decision making in PCI, but steady state hyperemia is very important. We should have a good catheter position. We should rule out drift. First of all, we see the vessel FFR. See if the distal most reading is less than 0.8. Only then you need to go into evaluation of the tandem lesion. Treat the lesion with the biggest pressure drop first, and then repeat the FFR. This is the only and the best way to treat tandem lesions. If you have a doubt whether the distal has a more pressure drop or the proximal, or if it it is equal, then probably you should treat the distal first and then repeat the FFR. But the most important thing is we should also keep the anatomy and safe landing zones in mind. So suppose we have a very diffuse disease. There is less than 10 millimeters distance between the proximal and the distal lesion, and you are uh, trying to analyze the tandem lesion. But if you can treat both the lesions with a stent. and the imaging also shows that you can get good stent expansion and you have safe landing zones and you can cover it with one stent and it is probably probably better that you cover the whole lesion with one stent rather than putting one stent repeating ffr then again putting another stent so you will complicate your procedure so a combination of physiology and imaging both are, both are very important so we should always try to limit the number of stents and we should probably use imaging more uh, conclusively in diffuse disease and not rely on ffr to make PCI decision making in diffuse disease where should be stent and where should be not probably imaging is better in diffuse disease but to find out whether the diffuse disease is causing vessel ischemia yes ffr is the better on but and, and at, at the end ffr based deferral is safe and even in serious so thank you so much thank you dr himanshu for the wonderful presentation the message is loud and clear when you have tandem lesions if the lesions are closer to each other probably go ahead if the vessel is ischemic go ahead and stent both the both the lesions with a very long stent if they are wide apart look for the maximum pressure drop treat the lesion with maximum pressure drop then repeat ffr see whether the second needs to be treated and when you have long diffuse lesion do, do not consider it as a tandem lesion always if the vessel is ischemic go ahead get the advantage of an imaging modality and then go ahead and stent the lesion wonderful message thank you so much uh, let me let me request my uh, co chair persons as well as panelists if they have any comments or questions if not dr rajesh thank you so much for the opportunity given please go ahead with the next session thank you everyone thank you thank, thank you, you. So uh, vijay please go ahead yeah we'll uh, move on to the next session uh, it is practicals learn step by step and uh, there are four talks in this thing followed by a plenary lecture and uh, without further delay i'll invite the first speaker is uh, dr anil dal good, uh, good evening sir. good afternoon sir is going to talk on role of ffr following pc optimization and meanwhile may i invite chair person dr arun mohanty dr roy sanjeev roy dr bc srinivas and dr lekha patak and the panelists for the session are going to be dr kumble dr r keswa dr manoj chopra dr rajpal singh and dr anunay gupta dr dal please So thank you, Rajesh. Thank you, Vijay. Um, it's good to be here and uh, hearing these great focused discussions and lots of learning in the last hour. Uh, we all know the value of, uh, and it has been stressed again and again, the value of physiology and imaging to actually improve our outcomes, to choose our cases judiciously, to stay out of trouble, to avoid complications, and to give long term results. But the this is going to be an introspective talk because whatever we may do. uh the sad part is that their patients uh, in about one year post pci 20 to 30% of them continue to have angina and we all have uh, various uh, different approaches to these patients uh, repeated stress tests would be done some people would have uh, repeat angiograms some people would have uh, a little more reduction of of uh, statin therapy presuming it is coming from the muscle some people would have enhancement of vitamin d but the fact of the matter is 20 to 30% of patients continue to have this problem and therefore this is something which even when it translates down into the catheter lab into the catheter physiology lab then we realize that 
post PCI residual ischemia could be as high as 17 to 36 percent. Yes, 17 to 36 percent is a huge number. And all of us who believe that uh, we are all doing such a perfect job to find that so many patients actually leave the catheter lab, which we presume because still a few years ago, the paradigm used to be that choose your cases to intervene on the basis of physiology. And then if at all you have to verify how they have done, you actually corroborate with imaging or you corroborate with the angiographic results and pat yourself on the back that you've done a damn good job. But if you realize that so much of post-PCI ischemia, ischemia still prevails, and if you correlate this with the FFR, which are done in these patients, then yes, there was a room for more study of this. And uh, uh, we also realized that right from the first angioplasty, apparently ache setting was in the cath lab when, when Andreas Grunzig was performing the first PCI uh, in Dolph Backman, and he did a transgenotic pressure gradient. And ache setting walked out and saying that this treatment is going to work because there was a pressure gradient which was, which was looked at. And we all know that if we have a trans genotic or a trans tent pressure gradient, it will have an increased risk of MACE. And, and there would be uh, some amount of uh, issues which would be left with these patients. So this was put to a, a comprehensive trial. We all know that the defined investigators and Alan Jeremias was the, was the PI. Uh, and uh, he actually, uh, the defined PCI included about 500 patients. Uh, and these were patients in whom uh, PCI of all vessels with abnormal baseline IFR with an angiographic confirmation, a blinded IFR, and a blinded IFR pullback at the end of the procedure. And uh, this excluded uh, STEMI within the last seven days, cardiogenic shock, prior CABG, CTO, severe LV dysfunction, uh, or if there was suboptimal TIMI flow at baseline or post-PCI, or if there was a procedural complication or thrombus. And what it did show us was that we did have a significant IFR gain in, in individual patients from pre to post-PCI, which is, which is pretty good. However, 24% of patients, despite a successful PCI and qualified IFR pullback, did continue to have residual ischemia with a post-PCI IFR of less than 0.89. Now, this could be, this is a really a food for thought because we need to be sure what we are dealing with. Do we have, uh, are we going to blame it all on, uh, uh, on the best vascular compliance? Are we, going to be, are we going to look for focal step-ups? Are we going to look for diffuse disease? Are we going to look for microcirculatory disease is something which we needed to study. And this also determined that there was a functional angiographic mismatch. And this, if you saw, also correlated with long-term MACE. And if the, if the post PCI FFR of less than 0.86 was definitely worse than a post PCI, uh, was definitely worse in those patients who had not had optimal I, uh, IFR, FFR results or optimal PDPA results. So 24% is a big ask. 467 patients, 24% have residual ischemia. Uh, this is one in four, it's not small. And, uh, and also if you looked at the post-PCI hemodynamics, this added incremental value to whatever clinical model, including inclusive of baseline clinical, angiographic, FFR, PDPA, or FFR model, and you could actually do a little bit of risk prediction modeling based on machine learning. So we did learn a few lessons that impaired post-PCI physiology is not uncommon and is associated with worse long-term outcomes. And uh, how do we use it clinically? Well, you can use it clinically by, by assessing the, the FFR or the IFR, and you need to then identify where exactly is the problem? Is it a diffuse disease, which has not been angiographically apparent? Is it a geographical miss? Is it inadequate coverage of lesion? Everybody's stressed 
on 50% plaque burden to 50% plaque burden, trying to insist on healthy to healthy. Is, was the stent underexpanded or undersized? Is it only in the LED location? Or as Himanshu just pointed out, could it be dealing with serial stenosis? And the defined PCI was conducted to understand the rate and causes of residual ischemia through blinded IFR pullback after PCI. Well, sometimes it could actually be diffuse disease, as you can see in this patient post, uh, post CABG. Uh, sometimes there could be a, a, an insignificant tandem lesion, which did not appear very significant. But when we combined it with physiology and imaging, we realized that it could actually be significant. Sometimes there could be severe distal spasm. So obviously we need to eliminate spasm. And uh, one of the questions which was probably asked by Praveen in an earlier session related to the wire going across, I think one of the most important things for the wire going across is that occasionally it does induce spasm and does not really cause a carabello-like phenomena. But, but spasm has to be seen. Are we dealing with a myocardial bridge with some negative remodeling here? So we need to be sure as to what we are dealing with in what appears to be angiographically normal or angiographically robust. Are we dealing with a hyperemic flow which is feeding collaterals to the CTO vessel? Because we realize that it is not just the stenosis which is responsible, but we are taking the pressure as a surrogate of flow. And if the flow is increased, well, uh, it is coming because it's also supplying a collateral. It could show us an impaired physiology. Could it be just a focal stent under expansion, which imaging will probably provide to? Could it be an edge dissection, uh, which is which is actually causing this? And we all know that when we have intubal hematomas at the end of our stents, uh, we all know that when we pull back the wire, many of these vessels close. So if you have a physiology and then you check it with imaging, you should possibly be able to cover this with another stent. So it was realized that out of this 24%, 80% continued to be a focal lesion, which was, uh, which was unapparent uh, angiographically, but it was definitely less than 15 millimeters. 18% were diffuse disease. Now the focal lesions, two thirds of this were proximal or distal to the stent. One third were inside the stent. By proximal or distal, we could uh, have missed, I either have a geographical miss or I had a, key, a less apparent lesion, a less eloquent lesion, which we had seen. So the defined PCI did give us an opportunity for improvement because if we actually improved on these, if we worked on this residual ischemia, then the residual ischemia came down from 24% to 5%, which means that it is something which we have not been doing all along, and we ought to be doing is to check post PCI physiology. So only about 5% would remain qualified uh, as ischemic despite our attempt. So, really, a post PCI physiology pullback can unmask angiographically occult lesions, which may benefit from additional intervention. Now, we all know that uh, by precision PCI. And uh, uh, when we are when we are actually uh, being able to assess the individual contribution of tandem lesions, especially using IFR or using a steady state by an intravenous adenosine and doing a pullback with a PDPA or an IFR reading, we can assess the individual contribution of tandem lesions, and we can we can do this very well with the resting pullback and also have an, an image co-registration. So if we can do this, we can also find out which of these lesions is going to contribute how much to the residual ischemic burden, whether in terms of being diffuse, uh, where if it is diffuse, it is very unlikely that it is going to respond to any subsequent PCI, either by an additional balloon or by an additional uh, device or by an additional stent. But if it is focal, there is very likely to be a very large increase in flow with PCI. So we need to understand uh, by IFR co-registration, we can actually display the IFR drop along the angiogram, which highlights which portion of the vessel is ischemic, whether it is focal or ischemic. And so a lot of algorithms have actually hit uh, uh, the, the media, the press, 
uh, the, the, the medical literature. So we very clearly check the physiology to see if we have a good physiology at the end of the procedure. If not, then we should do either a pullback with poor registration or do an imaging and to consider further intervention and again, look for ending physiology because you need to see clearly, treat optimally with IFR for registration. And this leads to a, a kind of a precision PCI, which, which has a better planning strategy, lesion modification, as Vijay has already pointed out, with stent sizing, as is very eloquently demonstrated by, by Silver Money. And with co-registration, we can move further to using this to minimize MACE, because MACE may be mistakes using angiographic coronary evaluation. Now, Kelvin Eddy, and this was pointed out, combined OCT with FFR, and the combined FFR and OCT, especially in ACS, uh, could uh, identify more lesions and therefore should be embraced. Uh, the defined group also put this to work because they sometimes felt that maybe it is the increased flow which is, which is causing uh, this impaired IFR or FFR. So they, they had another model, the CFR, and we know that CFR, whereas FFR uses pressure, CFR uses flow, and, and uh, this FFR, IFR discordance was put to a test uh, uh, by the defined flow study, which is a, a small study with not many patients, uh, but what it proved was that the natural history of FFR of less than 0.8, even if the CFR is more than two, is not non-inferior to lesions with FFR more than 0.8 and, F and CFR more than two, which just tells us that even high flow on CFR did not negate the importance of low FFR in determining which cases could safely be deferred. We need to distinguish between flow to downstream myocardium and the pressure that acts against the local plaque. The target FFR uh, was a physiology-guided optimization, and they called it PIOS, physiology-guided increment optimization strategy. They looked for whether there was a diffuse gradient. They looked for a hyperemic transient gradient, and they looked for a focal step up. And the target FFR uh, found that physiology-guided PCI did not lead to a greater proportion of patients having an optimal FFR of more than 0.9 in treated vessels. But that said, the strategy did reduce the proportion of patients with FFR less than 0.8. So what it means is we will not have anemia, but we may not approach one. So like uh, I think Nagin is going to point out in the next presentation, FFR sometimes looks too simple. There are many technical challenges. We, we have 18, 20% drift, some guide damping, some uh, aortic waveform distortion, intervariability, there can be some discrepancy between FFR and non-hyperemic uh, pressure ratios. We could be looking at decrease in flow because of, uh, of maybe a CTO which is being supplied. And, and also in female gender, there could be some issues. But most important is that we must not forget that FFR and IFR are continuous variables and in event rate is not zero about 0.8. And this is something that if you need to prognosticate and, uh, and decrease symptoms, we need to be very clear that we are not really looking at target numbers. So uh, very, Javier Escanet gave this very nicely in the first issue of uh, Jack Asia, whereas uh, not just doing a, a pre-PCI assessment, but in post-PCI, again, look at the FFR pullback look whether it is focal, look whether it is diffuse. If it is focal, definitely add imaging and, and, and go ahead and treat this. So this is going to be further put to test. I already recruitment has started with the defined GPS. And when we have this, we'll probably be in a better position to be able to have a GPS-like situation which will predict which of these both of the patients are likely to have some optimal results even beforehand. So I'll, I'll conclude my talk here and uh, over to the chairperson. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, nice uh, presentation, Dr. Vardal, as usual. And uh, you are a prolific speaker, we know. And uh, uh, lovely listening to you about FFR. Regarding the post-PCI FFR, we have data where uh, one third of the patients are uh, less than 0.9. So if you have a 0.9, less than 0.9, Optimizing these patients, we don't have a data for outcome study. 
there is a trial of course uh, ffr retreat uh, which is looking after this uh, randomized to ffr alone and a no intervention versus i was guided intervention uh, in the arm the result is yet to come but what is your take on on this actually do you think uh, by optimizing we reduce the events uh, or is just a marker of a diffuse disease many a time you fail to understand after optimization also more than uh, half of your patients will not achieve that 0.9 uh, magic number so what is your take on this uh, issue so uh, a good question but uh, probably i was going a little fast and therefore you did not in the target ffr they actually looked at this uh, incremental physiology guided incremental optimization and they actually felt that when you do a physiology guided optimization and you are looking at the focal disease if you treat that focal disease you will get less and less people with less than 0.8 uh, residual ffr but you may not get so many people to increase beyond 0.9 i think that is what tells us that in every patient and this may be somewhere where we need to work more on biology of atherosclerosis rather than only providing mechanical solutions because this may be having to do with the lbdp it may be having to do with the microcirculation it may be having to do uh, with vasospasm in the distal bed and so on and so forth but if we have the mind imaging at least we by define pci we realize that one fourth of the cases that we were taking on and 80% of them actually had focal disease which we could correct to a large extent i think this is a great take home because it 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 will really help us uh, for, with a little bit more of exertion help our patients achieve better results in the long run do 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 mean uh, before i pass on to the, uh, the other chairperson dr roy uh, do you mean uh, you have to have a imaging tool uh, integrated with this uh, pci if you are doing a post pci ffr study see I, i i don't know about your practice but i think the world over when people have suboptimal uh, physiology uh, this was one of the this was one of the criticisms of the defan pci trial that they did not have imaging in all these patients but if i did have a suboptimal uh, post pci physiology i would definitely use all tools at my disposal including imaging by whatever means available to optimize and improve the results okay thank you dr roy please sanjeev you are mute dr dr roy you are muted unmute Dr. Dhan sir, I must congratulate you on uh, presenting an uh, excellent topic and uh, pre excellent presentation. Uh, you mentioned about CFR, so uh, carrying on the discussion where uh, uh, Mohanty left. So, if you have a suboptimal uh, FFR, you have not reached the target of uh, 0.9. How you feel that CFR will be able to bail you out of situation? Because if CFR is normal, you might very well leave them on med aggressive medical management. that was the hypothesis based on which the defined flow was done but uh, we must understand that the defined flow study had very few subjects the cohort had total of 246 subjects uh, i don't know whether uh, the matters been studied completely secondly even when we perform a cfr there are too many assumptions there are too many geometrical and mathematical assumptions which are actually made so our uh, our uh presuming a cfr is not always appropriate i think it makes a little more sense here to combine you know cfr is elegant in physiology in in concept because we understand that uh, if there is increased flow then that may be contributing to the lower ffr or the ifr but in terms of what we have to do mechanically with our tools at our disposal i think the point which uh, arun asked is what would i do i would probably not use cfr and i would probably use imaging and so i am sure would you uh, to to actually see what you can do to intervene and conceptually we understand that that if your cfr is increased you can have uh, you can that can be one explanation for the limited ffr dr uh, uh, dhal your brief comment about uh, uh, stent expansion more than 80% by imaging versus uh, post pci ffr more than 
what's a correlation okay, now, and which should be taken in, uh, into consideration so so this is a very gray area because if because uh, by and large we all know that from the uh, from the ultimate to the music to the xpl we, we all know the criteria differences that we have gone through different imaging tools uh, the different years in which those imaging tools were uh, and uh, we all understand that stent expansion and if if you are still having an a, an ffr or an ifr which is suboptimal at 80% i would and a, if my eel permits i would definitely like to optimize this a little better and restudy it i think that's the point you were trying to make yes i would do it uh, i would not just leave it uh, geographically which 80% and i'm i'm satisfied with it i think physiology adds a lot to our understanding of just going by these preset rules of 80 and 90% thank you very much and uh, let's move to the next uh, talk by dr nagendra chauhan regarding ffr pitfall and its uh, solution dr chauhan please sir you are muted dr chauhan you are muted nagend you are muted good afternoon dear persons and i want to thank dr vijayvargi for giving me the opportunity and it's a very nice conference and many things to learn so my job is to give you the solutions and pitfalls about the ffr so i think ffr many things are already discussed so i will cut short my talks as we all know the cut off is 0.8 Uh, for outcomes but as dr dhal was also pointing this is very important to understand that what we are giving by cut off is now we are not saying that point a there will not be any event so this is just an example that uh, uh, anything more than point a event rate will still be there maybe if you are deferring them maybe 2 to 3% event rate is still be there but if we, uh, uh, it is less than points eight then definitely the event is are much more if you defer them and if you do it still there will be some events but it will definitely much less than the post angioplasty events and again it is very important to understand that many lesions which we which look significant to us are not actually and many lesions which we are missing uh, because they look 50% may be significant it depends on physiology not on anatomy so the basis of anatomy uh, for deciding lesions is definitely not a good idea in this present scenario and this was shown in multiple trials and even now five year data of this same trial has also shown came to that even we can reduce mitral infarction rate because previously it was thought that we are reducing mace rates by reducing the speed angioplasties but there is no hard reduction in hard end points like a still that there is no decrease in the death rate significantly but definitely we can reduce mitral infarction to some extent so with this uh, we all know that angiography may be slightly better than coin flip in deciding team and lesions but resting physiology alpha is significantly good almost 80% and if there is any confusion in resting physiology you can go for a proper hyperemia guided ffr which is considered to be 95% sensitive and specific and that's why esc guidelines have now included is that if you are using ffr along with angiography this is the best way to decide for the lesion but definitely there are many fallacies of this and the problem here is as we are already discussing that the single cut off may not be true for all patients because definitely there are different patients with different diseases different uh, physiology and different comorbidities so ischemia again as i was discussing is an obstructive epicardial vessel and it may not correlate with the mace or death or mi in every patient and definitely as we all know that in acute microscopic damage in acute mi with thrombus situation it may be underestimating so all these basic fallacies we all know and if we understand the basics i don't think it will affect much in about decision making so this is a classical graph which shows that for death and mi the threshold is generally for ffr is 0.64 not the 0.80 which is there for the repeat vascularization and mace so if we consider threshold as 0.8 which is just a single number we may be wrong since some time as the this studies done are much older and now if we go for the advanced angioplasty techniques the event rates have gone down so maybe a new ffr of 0.85 may be a right idea but again and the medicines have also Im- improved and medical therapy has also improved much and even better than angioplasty i can say so even a ffr of 0.75 or 7 may be more accurate in those kind of situations so everything depends on the lesion if lesion is a very simple type a lesion you know the event it will be very less even a 0.85 ffr may be good for you but even if a lesion is very complex and you are just fixing a small part of it then a lesion ffr of 0.7 or 0.65 may be the ideal thing 
So everything depends on the patient's specificity. And I think this was all discussed about FFR and CFR. I will not go into details of this because we can't do much about CFR. And this uh, is regarding the thrombus, which again a fallacy, which we can't help it because in uh, thrombotic lesions in acute culpity events, there is always some decrease in the flow, which may increase after the uh, improvement in the myocardial flow. So in these lesions, you may always underestimate, but in chronic lesions, because of permanent damage, if the FFR is uh, underestimated, it's acute, and we can follow this. So in uh, damaged vessels, if FFR is low, you don't have to endoplasty them. So coming to pitfalls, there are multiple issues, like viral-related issues, catheter-related issues, patient-related issues, and then there are some things which I already discussed, like tandem lesions and gray zones. So in terms of uh, uh, wire-related issues, there are multiple issues. One is the important issue is that the wire is not that flexible as the routine PTCA wires, and there's always a risk of spasm or dissection. There are dissections reported in multiple trials, although the, the numbers are very less. So for what you can do is if the wire is not crossing the lesion, what you can do is you can cross with a simple wire and uh, either go with a microcatheter and exchange the wire, or you can use a parallel wire technique. Once the simple wire is gone, then it is easy to cross that lesion if there is tortuosity. So this is one thing I think drift is also discussed. So when you are coming back after taking a gradient, if there is difference in the uh, pullback gradient versus the aortic pressure it is more than 0 0.05, it is significant in patient in which gray zone area. So you have to always correct it and then only you can recorrect it. So it's very easy to check. Uh, if there is a notch visible in the FFR wire tracing also, this means that it's drift. And if there's a ventricularized kind of pattern in the FFR wire trace and the normal traces like aortic trace, it means this is a true gradient. So this is very easy to recognize and you can easily correct it by again zeroing or equalizing the pressure and coming back to the neutral, neutral position and doing it again. The other important thing is about the artifacts. There are multiple artifacts, so you always have to take the FFR when the uh, both lines are parallel and it is a streamlined flow, not in the places where there is a irregularity in the flow. So these are the minor things which are to be followed. The other important thing is about catheters. So if you, you are using a catheter, the catheter can cause obstruction in the ostia. There can be a very small catheter which can obstruct the flow or contrast media inside can also obstruct. So again, if the flow is ventriculized both in the aorta, so then definitely there is some wedging or some problem is there. So the FFR will not be correct. So in those situations, again, either you have to disengage or flush the catheter and you can see that by flushing, you can see the uh, aortic trace is now much normal. And then you can record actual FFR in these situations. So all these minor things are important when you are recording FFR. I will not go into the, again, one small comment about coffee. So this was reported that if you take too much of coffee, that can cause some abnormalities in FFR. It's not a good idea to have a coffee before the procedure, uh, even before three, four hours also. And if you are using a side hole catheter, which is a practice in some places, then FFR may, be, may not be correct because the pressure at the, the guide ostium and pressure at the side hole may be different and the flow dynamics may be different, so it, they may not be accurate. So it's not a good idea to use a side hole catheter. Even if you are using it, then you have to totally disengage the catheter after you have given that nothing, so that the pressure difference will not be much. So these small things are to be considered before we go for uh, final decision making. The other important thing is about gray zone. As we are already discussing that we have taken a uh, cutoff value of 0.8, it may not be accurate for every patient. So between 0.75 to between 0.85, there's always a gray zone. And here you have to decide on your clinical acumen uh, and on your imaging if you have some confusion. So although for a simple reason, a 0.8 cutoff is very good, but for a diffuse disease, for a tandem lesion, um, it may not be correct. So already tandem lesion is discussed, but this is a study which showed almost more than 1,000 patients. And in gray zone FFR, they have shown that the event rates are still happening and they're not that, uh, so there's quite a significant difference between these three groups which they have taken. So anything below 0.8 is still considered significant. Anything more than 0.8, you have to decide regarding your event outcomes versus FFR values. So I think tandem lesion already discussed, as we all know that if there's a distal lesion, this will always uh, decrease the flow in the proximal lesion. So there will always be underestimation of the proximal lesion. So it is very important to understand that where is the maximum pressure drop. So from 100 to 84 is almost a 16 pressure drop and 84 to 64 is 20 pressure drop. So you have to decide between these two. So generally, if the pressure drop is similar, I would prefer to stand the proximal lesion. But if there's a pressure drop which is significant in the distal part, I would always prefer to stand the distal part. But there may be a possibility that proximal is also significant. So in these kind of situations where the pressure drop is significant in both the lesions, 
it may be a good idea to have a long stand and cover both the lesion otherwise generally covering a proximal lesion is always better and you will find that this lesion may not be significant so this is just a small example uh, uh, that the pressure drop in the proximal lesion is much more as compared to the distal lesion so just fixing the proximal lesion is sufficient in this situation and the distal lesion will not be significant in a diffuse disease situation when there is uh, diffuse disease again you have to decide what you want to do so again you have to see where the maximum pressure drop so this here you can see the maximum pressure drop in the proximal part so first fix the proximal lesion and then decide about the distal lesion so as it was already i think already discussed in multiple discussions before the diffuse disease ffr may not be ideal but you have to pick and choose in left main also it's a major issue because left main if it is isolated left main it doesn't matter much but if it is the diffuse lesions in the distal vessels it will affect the severity of ffr again so this is just a i will end with a small case and very interesting case uh, 63 diabetic patient post pci 9 years back cva claudication ckd so multiple issues this time came with significant symptoms and going for planning for renal transplant tmt came out to be positive this is angiogram you can see that there is a om which is a tight reason the major om is flowing and the surg distal is very small so we are not worried led the proximal stent is flowing but there are some distal lesions so you here you can see that this is the led there is some lesion in the proximal part and some lesion in the distal part rc again is showing a diffuse disease uh, there is a tight lesion in the middle part so what is to be done in this kind of situation so because ffr is not looking very significant so it was decided that we should first uh, do the ffr of led and then we'll fix the om and rc so this was the plan because led was looking quite okay and this is the ffr of the led so you can see the ffr was quite significant here so the distal is 0.69 then 0.79 then 0.89 then 0.91 so everywhere there is a 10 drift of which is quite similar so it's kind of a diffuse disease situation and it's difficult to decide what to fix what not to fix so it was thought that probably we should fix the proximal and mid stand part with the stand and then we can have a good end result so i was was done and it showed a significant lesion and diffuse disease angioplasty was done with two stents and this is the result after angioplasty so even after the proximal and mid part fix the ffr has not changed so then it was thought that what is happening so this you can see that in the distal part ffr is significant the proximal part ffr is normal but there is something hazy thing looking in the proximal part of allergy so i was was done so imaging is important here so the proximal part has a stent and imaging was done which showed that at the bifurcation left main there is a calcified tight lesion which was always missed because no one was thinking about this was looking quite okay and because of the diffuse ffr the ffr value coming at this part is 0.91 which was not very accurate so definitely diffuse is again is a fallacy or a pitfall in ffr so, so in this situation finally left main bifurcation was done and once the left main bifurcation was done the results are quite okay and then the ffr of the om was tested and it was 0.85 so you can even leave it so once the left main bifurcation done ffr of om was normal it was left on and then it was thought that we should do an ffr of rc also and it was again not significant even with the wire trace very distally so the decision totally changed in this patient with all these things that actually we were planning for a rc and om and plasty and ultimately we landed up with doing angioplasty of left main bifurcation with led diffuse so with this i just want to conclude that definitely numbers don't lie we have to calculate them meticulously and we have to interpret them meticulously and if we do that definitely this will help in decision making in our angioplasty patient thank you thank you naginder and it was an excellent presentation Uh, we'll come back to the question answer session with you later on as dr uh, owen christopher raffel has been waiting for his keynote lecture so may i invite uh, dr owen christopher raffel for his keynote lecture on imaging in complex pci how do i plan my procedure dr ram and dr shridhar will be subsequently presenting their presentations over to you dr owen thank you very much um, and uh, hopefully you can uh, hear me and see my screen yes sir we do good 
Uh, once again, thanks to uh, uh, all of the organizing committee for inviting me for this meeting. Um, it's a shame it has to be uh, long distance, but uh, who knows, perhaps next year uh, we may be able to meet face to face again. Um, so this, my talk was on intravascular imaging and complex PCI uh, for the fellows course. Uh, now it's important to note, I think that um, there are some very good lectures from uh, that are coming through over the next uh, few days on individual topics. So I will try and keep this basic uh, really from the perspective that, you know, if you stick to the basics in imaging in the context of PCI, whether it's simple or complex, you can't go wrong. So we do know that there are inherent limitations to uh, coronary angiography for a number of reasons, which I have outlined here. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why we go to intravascular imaging. And as uh, the previous speakers have noted, physiology as well, because angiography uh, in some instances uh, um, isn't as accurate as we'd like it to be. So who are, who, which patients are these so-called complex PCI patients? Uh, now, uh, this really is a, is a complex really of patients who uh, have a number of comorbidities, uh, patients whose anatomy would be considered complex, either they have an ACS or multivessel coronary disease, calcified lesions, uh, instant restenosis, CTOs, uh, essentially any lesion which one would consider not straightforward really would fall into this category of complex PCI. So why do we use intravascular imaging for guiding PCI? And there, it's basically really to prevent stent failure, that's thrombosis and restenosis. And we do that by lesion assessment and looking at the consequences of our PCI to really prevent these. There are a lot of observational studies noting various parameters of uh, acute stent failure, that is us not doing a good job with stents with poor outcomes. And the biggest really is that a small MSA or an underexpanded stent is probably the biggest predictor of badness, thrombosis and restenosis. Others include geographic mess, secondary lesions, large plaque burden dissections and stent length, and to some extent malacquisition. So these are all the things we want to try and prevent, uh, whether we're treating a type A lesion or a complex bifurcation, uh, or a heavily calcified lesion. So is there any good prospective data to say that intravascular imaging actually helps? Uh, should we be using it more often? And there is increasing data showing that in fact, uh, intravascular imaging, even in routine cases, does actually provide some benefit. And the, there are a number of meta-analyses. This is one of them, which shows you know, all of these for death, stent thrombosis, it favors intravascular uh, imaging guidance. This is another randomized uh, 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 meta-analysis of uh, observational randomized studies, again, showing a benefit of favoring intravascular imaging. And even the randomized studies show some benefit of that in a number of parameters, mace, uh, stent thrombosis, etc. Uh, here, just demonstrating an all-cause mortality, myocardial infarction, and target vessel revascularization. Uh, when we look at uh, randomized control studies, this is one of the more, more updated uh, um, meta-analyses. It shows that even with randomized control studies, uh, intravascular ultrasound is favored for better outcomes for reducing mace in this group of patients. Uh, what about in complex lesions? Well, when uh, they uh, did a meta-analysis of uh, eight randomized control studies, looking at um, um, the complex lesions in particular, again, intravascular imaging guidance proved better in a number of scenarios. Uh, and that included cardiovascular mortality, uh, TLR, TVR, and overall mace. Uh, this really subtends not just standard coronaries, but left main coronaries, the, the other complex lesions. So I have a guidance for left main PCI, all cause mortality, significant difference. Another meta-analysis 
uh, of left main coronary artery IVUS guided studies. Again, similarly, IVUS guidance reducing MACE, favoring against angiography. So in these patients, if we are planning to use intravascular imaging, now if funding allows, and unfortunately we don't have access to routine intravascular imaging, even in Australia because of the cost, uh, the data would suggest we should be using it in most patients. At least our more complex patients, we should try and as far as possible use intravascular imaging to guide these procedures because the data there is increasingly uh, good. Uh, particularly for intravascular imaging, making a note that there is really no clear outcome data as yet for OCT, all the way using it as a surrogate given the good imaging that OCT provides. So from the point of view of, of a fellow's understanding of intravascular imaging, whether it's a simple or a base or a complex PCI, the same principles apply. Remember the basic principles, follow the basic principles, and you will not go wrong. And I go through the three aspects that I do, the P and the S and the O, plan and prepare, size, and then finally optimize. So what's plan and prepare? Well, the objective is to plan your PCI strategy with baseline intravascular imaging. Uh, what am I going to do? Uh, what strategy am I going to use if it's a bifurcation strategy? Uh, am I going to cross the side branch? How far am I going to stent? Secondly, look at the uh, morphology of the lesion to prepare the lesion to receive the scaffold because you do not want an underexpanded scaffold or stent. You also want to see, can we deliver all the hardware that we want to deliver? Uh, is it calcified that we're going to need to modify the plaque to deliver our stents? And obviously enable full expansion or pre-dilatation. And we do that by assessing, assessing the lesion morphology. And that then drives us to the choice of our balloons to predilate. Uh, if there's calcification that requires particular attention, should we be using just non-compliant balloons? Should we be using atherectomy? What about IVL, which is now a hot topic? Uh, if it's heavy fibrocalcific plaque, especially osteally, well, maybe we should be using a cutting balloon here. If it's a bifurcation, what are the side branch characteristics? Uh, can we manage just with a provisional strategy if the angiography is ambiguous or should we go with an upfront bifurcation strategy? Is the side branch at high risk of occluding? And of course, importantly, locating the proximal and distal reference segments where we want to land our stent in as normal a vessel as possible. And this is just really a, a, a caricature, if you like, showing using OCT, uh, the various scenarios where if you have a lipid, lipidic or just a fairly fibrotic but not fibrocalcific plaque, uh, you can either use direct stenting or just use a compliant balloon. But as your complexity increases a mixed plaque or deep calcium, then maybe you want to use non-compliant balloons. As the calcification increases, uh, and they're superficial and circumferential, then you need to look at maybe scoring balloons, cutting balloons, or even atherectomy devices. Now we have a whole host of uh, uh, scenarios that we can use uh, from primary stenting, cutting balloons, uh, laser rotation and orbital atherectomy, and of course, intravascular lithotripsy, which again is, is the sort of new kid on the block. Now, calcified lesions, we know if you have calcium, you don't do that well. This is one year outcomes on DES patients, where if you have heavy calcium, you don't do well in death and MI, ischemic TLR, or a combination of them. And now we have a number of algorithms and good intravascular imaging identifications of what all of this calcium is. So we've got deep calcium, uh, which we can see but not quantify as well on IVUS, but definitely on OCT. Superficial calcium, which again we can see on IVUS, and especially so on OCT, especially looking at the depth of that calcium, which we can't see on IVUS. Uh, concentric calcium, eccentric calcium, and we can measure the arc of how much calcium there is. And of course, then these big calcified nodules. And using this, we can now 
plan and prepare how we're going to manage this calcium. And there are a number of calcium algorithms. And we've now come up with uh, three factors that one wants to look at. One is the arc of calcium, how circumferential the calcium is, how thick the calcium is, especially if it's superficial, and the length of the calcium. And most of these, except for the calcium thickness, you can see on intravascular ultrasound as well. And we now know that if we give these a number of points, as we've done here, depending on the, uh, if the angle is more than 50% or 180, you get two points, more than 0.5 millimeters a point, and more than five millimeter length another point, that the more points you have between three and four, uh, stent expansion, and uh, minimal stent area is much inferior. And as a result, the corollary, the outcome is poor. So we now have this rule of fives, that if your arc of calcium is more than 50%, your thickness is more than 0.5 millimeters and the length more than five millimeters, then you need to do some form of aggressive preparation to get good stent apposition and good stent sizing. And we've got a number of algorithms, obviously, that have come about here, uh, which we can, uh, we can see uh, a number of which um, you will probably um, uh, hear about. This is the most common one, which suggests that if you have deep calcium, you go straight to your NC balloons, uh, your scoring balloons, the cutting balloons, which we all have access to. If you have nodular calcium, you uh, use rotational orbital atherectomy, then use your scoring balloons to get your final result. And of course, if you have superficial calcium, and you meet those significant, you know, the rule of fives. Uh, if you don't meet the rule of fives, you can go straight to NC balloons. If you meet the rule of fives, then if it's balloon uncrossable, you have to use rotablation or orbital atherectomy. If it is balloon crossable, now they say, let's go straight to intravascular lithotripsy. Now, the problem for us is that in Australia, that's over $5,000. So we like to, if it's balloon crossable, still go to the good old NC and scoring balloons. And if you get away with it, that's fine. If you don't get away with it and you have a little uh, waste, the so-called rotor regret, then you can go back to rotational atherectomy. And if that doesn't work, intravascular lithotripsy as a last resort, which is sort of a modification. Uh, and this is, I'd um, certainly recommend you read the recent sky position statement in uh, CCI from 2020, which gives a very good common sense approach uh, based on fluoroscopy, then intravascular imaging, uh, and then the various uh, uh, modalities that we can use as I discussed. And it's not as aggressive going straight to intravascular lipotripsy, uh, which is very expensive. Bifurcation lesions, uh, I'm not going to talk in too much detail about this, except to say that imaging is encouraged in all bifurcation stenting, uh, particularly if upfront bifurcation strategy is used, if there's concern regarding the side branch, if there's significant angiographic size mismatch, and or if it's a left main bifurcation, I think imaging should be mandatory. Uh, some interesting parameters, we're using OCT, uh, where if based on your bifurcation angle, if this bifurcation angle is narrow, if your carina tip angle is narrow and your branching point to carina tip dist distance is small, there's a high risk of side branch occlusion and you might want to uh, uh, either protect it significantly or go with an upfront bifurcation strategy. Uh, and um, this is an example which shows that if you have those bad features, then you are at risk of side branch occlusion. So at the least, protect it with a wire. Uh, the left main, there's going to be a good left main talk tomorrow, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it's important to know that angiographically, uh, we don't really get a good idea of the plaque distribution in the left main, in that 90% of the lesions, the distribution goes from the left main into the side branches. And uh, even when it's not uh, independent of the angiographic appearance, uh, the Medina classification based on IVA shows there's significant encroachment on plaque into the branches. So I think if you're ever intervening on the left main, you have to use intravascular ultrasound. Uh, restenosis, we know that there are several different morphologies of restenosis. Uh, this is one area where I think intravascular imaging is very important. 
and based on the different morphologies, whether it's simple neointimal hyperplasia, a calcified neoatherosclerosis, lipid neoatherosclerosis, or stained candor expansion. There are various algorithms that we can look at, and this is one of them. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into detail. That will tell you uh, that uh, what parameters you can use. So if it's under expansion, you have to very aggressively post dilate it to the reference segments. Next, going to size. This is the important thing of how you size it. You need to accurately size the vessels, select the appropriate stent for the best fit, and minimize the risk of acute and late stent failure. So what do we do? We need to identify uh, the reference segments, the EEL and lumen dimensions, and then the stent diameter based on EEL or lumen at distal reference. Now, what's the, what are these dimensions? So this is on IVUS. That's your lumen. And this is your EEL, which is the vessel. And in a vessel which doesn't have too much plaque, they're very similar. And if you're losing the lumen, you just up, the, up the, to the next 10 size. If you're using the vessel, you down to the next 10 size. Similarly with OCT, if you don't have a lot of plaque, you are actually able to see both parameters. But it's important to understand if you have a lot of plaque, the EEL is unreliable. And this is just a really a, a, a diagram just showing that you identify the reference segments, proximal and distal. You measure the EEL and lumen diameter and area at these segments. You then use the distal reference EEL. And if you can identify the distal reference EEL, you use that to size your stem. So you round down to the nearest stem size. If you can't see the EEL well, particularly in OCT, you use the distal reference mean lumen area and round up. So if it's uh, 3.2, you put in a 3.5 stent. Whereas if you're using EEL and it's 3.75, you round down to a 3.5 three stent. And this is a very safe way of doing it. And this is basically demonstrating that uh, whereas here you look at the two reference segments, the proximal and distal, and uh, based on the various parameters, uh, you can use the lumen or the vessel wall. Uh, and as aggressively, if you use the reference lumen, you're more aggressive. If you use the mean reference lumen, even so, the smallest reference lumen is probably the least aggressive. And that's probably what we'd use is the distal reference lumen uh, and uh, downsize if you're using the, ve the vessel, upsize if you're using the loop. And this is just another demonstration for OCT in particular, if you have a huge plant burden with positive remodeling, you've got to be very careful if you're using the EEL. There's a lot of uh, press now on using EEL for OCT. Um, when, it's, when you can see it, it's reasonable. If you can't, You've got to be very careful, and there's no downsizing to using the lumen and upsizing your stent to one stent size up from that. This is just a similar demonstration of IVUS. If you have a lot of plaque and a lot of remodeling, uh, if you're not careful in assessing it and just using numbers uh, without looking at the appearance of the vessel wall, you can run into a lot of trouble and oversize the stent and cause uh, uh, significant dissections and even... Uh, uh, stent disruptions. This is just an illustration of an OCT of uh, using your uh, lumen references and then sizing your stent based on that and on the length of the lesion. Finally, once you put your stent in, you have to optimize it. Now, ideally, we want to achieve at least uh, MSA of greater than 80%. Ideal 90%. So that's 80% of the reference lumen area. We need to ensure good stent strata position and exclude acute stent complications. Uh, post stent optimization assessment, uh, post dilatation based on the proximal reference segment, uh, based on stent and length sizing, we'll need to take into account tapering because if there's a long vessel and there's tapering, we don't want to uh, post dilate the distal segment to the proximal reference segment because we'll end up with some problems. Obviously, the bifurcation strategy is it a kissing or a pot, etc and looking at the side branch characteristics. This is a nice uh, diagram really showing what we want to achieve at the end of it. Um, 
minimum stent area is really the most important thing we want to achieve with an average at least of 80 percent. Uh, we've got all of these numbers of 5.3 and 5.4, but it's important to note that the area under the curves are actually quite low, suggesting that one single number doesn't cut it for everyone, and it's ultimately the percentage based on the vessel, which is why we use an 80% of MSA uh, compared to the reference segment. In, in IVAS, we've got the standard you know, 5, 6, and 8. But when we look at uh, the current Excel IVAS substudy, in fact, for the Caucasian population, they used it for a bit longer. Um, and we also know, interestingly, a, a good uh, point is despite of all the studies we've done, even with intravascular imaging, there's still a significant proportion of patients that actually don't achieve that, which is why we now pretty much go for an MSA of greater than 80%. Uh, just a quick example, here's a patient, a previously placed stent, who's come in with stent thrombosis. This is the OCT that was done. No imaging was done uh, post the first stent implantation. And here you can see the exact reason why this patient had stent thrombosis, stent failure. And that's, as we go through here, we can see that quite clearly. There's an underexpanded stent. That's the distal reference the proximal reference, a hugely underexpanded stent in the middle, and some malaposition. And you can see the reference segments and the stent, uh, how underexpanded that stent is. So intravascular imaging would have saved this patient a uh, stent thrombosis. Um, uh, next thing, obviously, is uh, so if you get a malapos uh, malaposition or underexpansion, then you've got to post dilate more aggressively and do a final intravascular imaging. What about dissections? Well, the dissections with uh, OCT we see quite often. And currently they say if it's less than 60% and it's angiographically not significant, we leave it. It looks terrible and they're anxiety provoking, but in general, most of these tend to heal up quite nicely. So unless you have uh, probably more than 180 degrees and a significant uh, 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 medial component, I think we should leave dissections alone. I think you base it on angiography and the clinical situation and not necessarily on intravascular imaging. Um, plaque burden, again, an important predictor of adverse outcomes if you stent into plaque burdens. So we want to place our stent where the plaque burden is less than 50% and there's no lipid pool. This is just an example of someone who had a stent to put in, in an ACS without intravascular imaging. You can see, well, there's a bifurcation here and I'd like to know where that bifurcation is. This plaque seems to be extending to the proximal LAD into the left main. This is a situation I probably would have used intravascular imaging. This is the appearance post stent. You can see the stent looks a little bit small and there's a little hazy thing out there. And when you look at that, you see something a little bit hazy. This is the OCT. The OCT begins right at the proximal stent edge. The first thing you see here is that's the distal reference, distal segment. That's the proximal segment. So it's already under expanded. And as we go proximally, we can see there's even been geographic miss. So angio angiographically, uh, the stent was placed with geographic miss. And in fact, the culprit ruptured plaque is proximal. So again, intravascular imaging would have helped here. As uh, a last um, example, this is uh, just an example of a patient who presented with an ACS, a dual LAD system. Uh, one of my colleagues stented that with a bare metal tsunami stent. You can see uh, the stent looks like it's crossing the diagonal here, but overall with a nice result with some distal embolization. Patient returned with significant angina and a positive stress test in six months. And this is what we found. This clearly restenosis here. And what we don't know is where the where the stent, whether the stent's gone into this the medial limb of the dual LAD, which is really a big septum. So we did intravascular imaging, and that this is intravascular imaging into that big diagonal. And what it shows very clearly here is that this is where the LAD and diagonal is. There is no, no stent at the bifurcation. So the stent actually begins, uh, ends just before the bifurcation. So that's good. We do see the stent is a little bit small here. And of course we can see there's no internet. 
So what we can do is we can size it very nicely, proximal and distal reference. We can also look at uh, the uh, bifurcation and we can see although the primal angle is shallow, the actual bifurcation angle is wide and the primal side branch distance is large. So uh, side branch occlusion risk is low. So we just put a stent into the diagonal just with a wire in the side branch for protection. We didn't, we were not worried about the side branch and we got a nice result as you can see here. So again, a useful uh, uh, example of way imaging. So in conclusion, the most important, I think, that with the use of imaging is there is good evidence to show it helps, even in all cases, in complex cases, it helps even more. And I think it's very important to use and I think it's underutilized. Finally, whether you're doing a simple or a complex lesion, the fundamental basics of preparing the lesion, sizing it and optimizing it, uh, if you stick to that, you won't go wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Christopher, an excellent uh, talk. Uh, may I ask you some two quick questions? The first is that, can you hear? Of course. Think there is some problem in the audience. Uh, uh, Dr. Christopher, uh, uh, a wonderful talk. I have a couple of doubts in my mind. After this, uh, uh, we know I was under uh, overestimate the vessel and OCT is accurate. Do, what is your view about HD IVUS? There are some studies, HD IVUS is accurate uh, vessel dimension. Any points on that uh, regarding HD high definition IVUS? Yes, so we, we've had limited access to HD IVUS and you're probably right. If you look at um, uh, the standard IVUS uh, and the OCT, you have the two opposites, if you like, and the HD IVUS is somewhere in the middle. I think the, the thing to look at are the clinical studies and the vast majority are with our standard IVUS. And if you use the algorithms that the studies have used and that's if you're using the vessel or the EEL, you downsize by one stent size, or if you're using the lumen, you upsize by one, taking into account all of the, the plaque morphology at the reference segments, you probably can't go wrong. And that's really based all on, on IVA studies. Uh, we don't know whether that transcribes similarly to OCT because we don't have the data for OCT except we would hope it would because the image resolution is so much better. Uh, the Illumium 3 study uh, didn't really help us much at all. It showed that um, the sizing with OCT and IVUS was comparable. Uh, and you know that's what they present quite a bit uh, sort of in the press. But interestingly, it was no different to angiography, which is a surprise because most of the IVUS studies and geography, uh, uh, IVUS was much better than angiography. So there was fu something fundamentally wrong with the Illumium 3 study, I think. Um, where HD IVUS comes in, not sure yet. Certainly the resolution is one step higher than the standard IVUS. Uh, but I think we will need to look at some proper randomized study looking at that. I suspect it will be very similar to the standard IVUS. One more uh, simple uh, question about this, uh, just small doubt. We have a sub-study recently published uh, uh, this adapt ds data of IVAS criteria of vessel diameter, MSA divided by vessel area. More yeah. than 38 is a predictor, strongest predictor out of all parameters. Even eccentricity index and other things are not so much important. This has uh, given us some idea about um, IVAS uh, data. Do you think yeah. this translates to OCT as well? Um, it probably will, uh, but I think, and this is the thing with OCT, uh, you have to prove it. Uh, early on, we always said, look, yeah, the resolution's better. So, you know, you can see more dissections, you can see more malapposition. So it should do, but I think it has to prove itself. I'm not sure we can say uh, conclusively like, yeah, just because it's good for IVAS, it's good for OCT as well. 
And the Illumium 3 study, as I said, didn't inspire any confidence in that regard because it was no better than angiography. Yeah. And of course, the outcome data, while it wasn't part for that, so we'll have to wait for Illumium 4. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rafael, for sparing the time today evening. Uh, uh, as you are based at Brisbane, Australia, we are very, really obliged by your talk on uh, detailed presentation of the role of imaging in uh, PCA. With the due permission from the chairperson, let's go ahead for the last talk by uh, Dr. Ram Chitlengya. He's going to talk about IVS pitfall and uh, image interpretation. Dr. Ram, please. Dr. Ram, Dr. Could Ram you... am, I, am I audible now? Yes, sir, you are. Yeah. And could you go on to the slideshow, please? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so it, uh, it is a pleasure to be with uh, all the uh, uh, faculty and my teachers uh, regarding the talk of fibrous image interpretation and pitfalls. So my job has become uh, much more easier after an excellent talk by Dr. Owen. And he has covered almost everything regarding imaging. And still, uh, for the sake of completion, I will uh, repeat many of the things uh, in my talk. So, uh, as we all know that uh, the normal coronary has a trilaminar structure on intravascular ultrasound. And the innermost layer is composed of intima. And uh, if there is any diseased artery, then atheroma will be there inside intima and internal elastic lamina. Middle layer is the media. And the outer layer is composed of adventitia and the periadventitial issue. <clears throat> The EM is the discrete interface between the media and adventitia, but uh, sometimes all three may not be appreciated in all the cases. So coming straight forward to the uh, image interpretation and the image guidance during PCI for of IVAS. So the intravascular ultrasound can be used before PCI as well as during the PCI and after the PCI as well. So before PCI, the main uh, role of intravascular ultrasound is the, the, regarding the strength sizing, uh, the detection of plaque morphology, severity, vessel sizing, as well as detection of calcific plaque and uh, spontaneous dissections, if any, there are present. That uh, will lead to better selection of PCI strategy as well as devices uh, in plaque modification and the preparation of the stent bed. During uh, image uh, PCI, definitely it will uh, help us in guiding the stent malposition, tissue prolapse, under expansion and edge dissection, out of which the most important will be the under expansion. So reduction of peric procedural complication and improvement of clinical outcome is there due to lower risk of instant restraints and thrombosis. So that is the overall target to uh, have lesser and lesser device failure uh, with the use of intravascular imaging. So to start with, the, when we plan the PCI with the IVAS, uh, the most important and first thing that we, we should look is the maximum plaque burden area. And the plaque burden will be defined as the ratio of atheroma area to vessel EEL. And actually it is plaque plus media area. And uh, non-culprit plaque burden more than 70% uh, were associated with the long-term MACE in the prospect trial. And also virtual histology can uh, help us in some TCFA detection. So plaque burden is equal to plaque area as upon EEL area. As we can see in a, an example of angi angiogram in which there is a moderate uh, looking disease in the LED. Uh, but when we did an uh, imaging, the distal reference vessel was normal, but uh, the maximum plaque burden was around 83% uh, in this LED and the vessel size was around 4 or 4.5. So we stented this vessel and uh, we got a uh, negative FFR after this stenting of the vessel. So any moderate looking lesion in patient who is symptomatic for any uh, uh, angina or these things. So we should uh, go ahead with the intravascular ultrasound as well as the functional assessment of the vessel. Uh, which will lead, uh, give us many insights regarding the plaque burden and plaque morphology. The other important thing which we uh, need to assess during IVAS is the uh, guidance for stent implantation. So we need to assess the vessel sizing as well as the landing zones. So there are some definitions like proximal reference time 
diameter, distal reference diameter, where the minimum uh, plaque button will be there with the largest human proximal to stenosis or distal to stenosis. The average reference vessel diameter will be the average of proximal as well as distal reference human. And the lesion and stenotic site will be at least 50% uh, human compromised uh, by the CSA dimension. So we have to calculate all these, uh, uh, we have to define all these landing zones, and then we have to decide our stent diameter as per these uh, landing zones. Uh, as we all know that stent under expansion is the most powerful uh, predictor of early stent thrombosis and restenosis. So as had been discussed in the previous talk that progressive approach to stent uh, uh, sizing is the smallest reference human diameter followed by mean reference human diameter followed by largest reference human diameter and followed by smallest reference EEM diameter. So these are the uh, progressive area where we can choose the progressively larger stents depending on our strategies choose, chosen as well as the modality which is being used uh, in IVAS versus OCT. The stent diameter uh, uh, is very important and true vessel sizing and detection of positive and negative remodeling is uh, uh, possible with the IVAS allowing up of appropriate stent sizing. And the most practical approach is to use the mean distal reference diameter. Uh, if we are uh, Chasing the lumen based sizing, uh, then we should upsize the stent by 0 to 0 0.25 millimeter. And if we are using the EEL based sizing, then we should downsize the stent by 0 0.25 millimeter. The optimal stent uh, landing zone is the IVAS derived normal segment, uh, which has an area less than 50% plaque burden. And stent, if we land our stent in less than more than 50% plaque burden, and particularly in lipid rich plaques, it will lead to stent edge restenosis. And also incomplete stent coverage of lipid pool leads to periprocedural MIs. Uh, the co registration of IVAS with angiography is also important for strength and selection and precise implantation. Uh, overall, the IVAS guidance uh, will lead to more longer stents and uh, as well as the larger stents in the most of the cases because you are able to see the vessel from inside and you are able to get the uh, exact sizing as compared to angiography alone. So these are the examples uh, in which uh, in pre-PCI and the, after PCI, we can define the distal reference diameter as well as a lesion uh, area where there is a maximum plaque button and proximal reference diameter. And uh, finally, we can achieve a good MSC uh, with the help of the intravascular ultrasound in the uh, maximum uh, diseased area. So IVAS helps in, us in uh, stent implantation uh, by uh, giving us the proper sizing as well as the diameter of the stent. Uh, coming to significance of stenosis, uh, although uh, significance of stenosis is not the domain of the IVAS and FFR is considered the gold standard, but uh, there are some MLA cutoff areas where we can uh, decide whether there's uh, some lesion is uh, significant or not if uh, we don't have the uh, uh, physiology in our lab. So 2.1 to 4.4 millimeter square is considered a cutoff for non-LMC region as uh, and 4.56 millimeter square is considered for LMC lesions. There is a rule of thumb that is 4 millimeter square and 6 millimeter square for non LMC and LMC lesions. But these values should not be used to justify intervention unless substantiated by SFR. So there is an example where, where which the, there is a moderate looking stenosis in the angiography, but uh, when the imaging was used, the MLA was uh, very less and it was only 2.5 millimeter square, leading uh, to giving rise to angina and it was stented. Uh, with the proper stent and the patient was relieved of symptoms. The most other uh, important use uh, in image interpretation on IVAS is the, what we want to know is the uh, plaque morphology. And uh, most important use of IVAS uh, will be regarding the detection of calcific plaque. So angiography has low sensitivity, but high predictive value for uh, detection of calcified plaque, but IVAS is definitely superior for detection, localization, as well as quantification of cal calcification. So most important for calcified plaque, uh, which is productive of strength delivery failure and uh, strength under expansion is the calcified plaque. And calcium index is there uh, to see the product of angle of calcified arc as well as its longitudinal length, which can help in determine the extent and the, as well as the modality of plaque modification, which is required in the particular case. The problem with IVAS is that IVAS cannot penetrate the calcium and can detect only the leading edge of the calcium. So it cannot give us the calcium thickness, which can be very well estimated by the uh, OCT. But still, we can uh, appreciate the superficial calcium, which is the uh, leading when the leading edge of the caustic shadowing appears within the most shallow 50% of the plaque plus media thickness versus the deep calcium, where it is uh, towards the um, side of advantage and it lies within the deepest 50% of the plaque plus media thickness. Arc of calcium can be measured in degrees or it can be uh, defined in quadrants. 
and uh, as we all know that uh, if the, it is more than 180 degree quadrant then it requires a extensive clock modification techniques by the use of uh, uh, cutting balloon or ivl or a very aggressive high pressure ballooning so these are the various examples of the uh, calcified plaques in which the a shows the calcified plaque in only a uh, superior quadrant of the artery versus uh, b uh, showing a protruding uh, calcium in the uh, uh, middle quadrant of the artery versus a 270 degree of arc as well as a uh, 360 degree arc of calcium. So these things are very important to assess, uh, which cannot be identified on angiography. As uh, we can show in this case, uh, which I did uh, recently around three days back, and there was a uh, non-dilatable uh, RCA lesion with the NC balloon, and I did try to dilate it with the NC, uh, cutting balloon as well. Uh, followed by imaging was done, which showed a 360 degree arc of calcium with a significant lumen compromise. And uh, after that, I suggest I chose the IVL uh, with the strength. Uh, then uh, post IVL, I could achieve a very good MSA and in a vessel of uh, four millimeter square. So uh, imaging is very important. If uh, we are using the NC balloon and if we are checking the orthogonal angles of uh, NC balloon dilatation, they can be uh, frequently misleading. And uh, we should use imaging more and more to detect these calcified blocks and to get the optimal outcomes. In non calcific plaque, there can be uh, soft plaques, which are lipid uh, laden plaques. There can be hard plaques, fibrous plaques, and uh, definitely the other is calcific plaque. Uh, the soft plaque does not require any extensive plaque modification technique, but the hard plaques or the plaques which appears more bright on uh, intravascular ultrasound, they may require cutting balloon uh, for uh, plaque modification followed by the optimal spent, uh, strength expansion. So these uh, things are important to recognize on the imaging. IVAS can also optimize the PCI uh, by detecting the abnormalities after the stent implantation, like the under expansion, uh, geographical miss, strut uh, malaposition, edge dissection, and tissue prolapse, which has been covered very well by uh, Sir in the previous talk. But the, the most important part, which we want to know, is the strent under expansion with resultant smaller MSC. And this will be the most important determinant of the early as well as late stent failure. OCT is definitely superior in detection of uh, the other three things like malaposition, edge dissection, and thrombus detection. But if there is a significant edge dissection on uh, IVAS with medial involvement, then we should treat it uh, properly with the additional strent. And it has, it has been shown that uh, proper op properly optimized PCI has uh, got a better outcomes in the long term as compared to uh, improperly uh, done PCI. Although visually they may look similar, but uh, optimization of PCI is very important. So strength expansion uh, in non-LMC lesion more than 5.5 millimeter square and more than seven uh, in distal LMC and more than 18 proximal LMC is the best predictor of outcome. Uh, and MSA cutoff is uh, of more than 80% relative to average of proximal and distal reference lumen appears reasonable in clinical practice. And we should try to achieve at least 80% expansion of the uh, reference uh, vessel lumen. So this is again the study which showed the rule of 5, 6, 7, 8. And uh, many a times with that, we see that uh, the circumflex ostium is the most uh, uh, neglected and uh, sometimes we are unable to achieve the proper MSA. So we should... Uh, take these cutoffs and uh, then we should try to achieve these at least in the area of left wing bifurcation uh, when we are optimizing the PCI. Malaposition is again, uh, it is a better uh, uh, diagnosed on uh, OCT, but still uh, significant malaposition can be seen very well on IVAS. And uh, we should try to reduce the malaposition by the aggressive strength, uh, aggressive post dilatation with a compliant or semi-compliant balloon uh, to have a light, uh, lesser strength thrombosis than the device failure. Malaposition alone definitely is not a definitive predictor of stent failure and it can resolve with time with the uh, remodeling of the vessel, but it is a predictor of very late stent thrombosis and extensive malaposition should be treated when feasible after PCI. Similarly, tissue prolapse is defined as tissue extrusion from inside of the stent area and uh, it can be either lesion extrusion or in it can be due to atherothrombotic material. And definitely OCT is a better modality to, uh, to see this uh, because of the better resolution. And uh, tissue prolapse in ACS cases is definitely more harmful than non-ACS cases. The sections which I have already seen, uh, it is uh, uh, more uh, easy to recognize on OCT, although if there is significant dissection and a medial dissection, it can be very well seen on IVAS, uh, including the presence of any hematoma in the extra uh, stent area. Uh, then if the dissection is more than 200 uh, micrometer distal, uh, but not at proximal edge, they are uh, predictors of uh, major adverse cardiac event. 
and depth at least uh, disrupting the media with lateral extension of more than 60 degree and length more than two millimeter, they should be treated with a, another stent. IVAS can be helpful in CTO PCI. It helps in resolving the pro proximal health gap ambiguity. Uh, it can uh, show us the proximal, confirm the proximal cap puncture. It can confirm the wire location in relation to Rulimon. And uh, nowadays uh, we can use IVAS uh, for with uh, 3D wiring. Uh, the advantages of IVAS uh, uses in CTO is the no need to integrate injections. It can give us the real three time, uh, real time 3D orientation. And with the availability of short tip uh, catheters, uh, we can very well use the IVAS in blunt CTOs and by using the side branches. Stent failure can also be assessed uh, using the imaging. Uh, it can be due to restenosis, uh, due to neointimal hyperplasia, chronic underexpansion, stent fracture, or neoatherosclerosis. It is a class 2 AC recommendation for uh, intracoronary imaging in stent failure. And OCT is definitely a preferred modality for these uh, uses. Coming to the artifacts uh, of uh, intravascular ultrasound, specifically, uh, uh, which are the one of them is the non uniform rotational uh, distortion that is NURD in motion artifacts. It is uh, unique to the mechanical system and it does not exist in the uh, other system. Uh, it happens with the rotation of the uh, IVAS catheter due to the mechanical binding of the drive cable. And uh, when the catheter uh, bends an artery in the or within the tortuous guide catheters, excessively tight hemodynamic valve or kink in the imaging sheet or too small guide catheter lumen or maybe some due to some manufacturing defect, these uh, NURDs appear in the arteries and we should be able to recognize these uh, non-uniform rotational distortions. And it can occur from the non-stable catheter position and the vessel movement during the acquisition as well. The other artifact is the ring down artifact where, where there's a bright halos of variable thickness around the catheter by the acoustic oscillations in the transducer. And uh, other can be the blood speckle artifact, which will be with increased transducer frequency or slower blood flow. It also limits the ability to differentiate the lumen from the blood. So uh, these artifacts can also appear with the slow flow. Then other artifacts are the obliquity artifact, eccentricity and vessel curvature artifact. If the vessel is curved, then it uh, can give us a, a false impression of an elliptical vessel because the uh, best imaging happens with the catheter when the catheter is coaxial within the vessel and the beam strikes the target at 90 degree angle. But if the vessel is oblique, then uh, it can lead to overestimation of the dimensions and reduction in the image quality. And there can also be some problems with the spatial orientation of the IVAS and absolute anterior, posterior and right and left orientation is not possible in the IVAS. Although with the, uh, if we can locate the pericardium, then uh, it, we can be able to see the diagonals and septals because they usually go uh, diagonally opposite diagonals and septals. And sometimes uh, we can uh, uh, rotate the images and electronically and then we can uh, orient our, our eyes to the IVAS images to di uh, and identify the different vessels on uh, imaging after the assessment. Ram, will you like to conclude? Uh, we are already running late by half yes, an hour. Sir. Yes, sir. Just, uh, just one minute, sir. So these are the again artifacts of the IVAS. Uh, the uh, coming to complications of IVAS, the most common is vascular spasm, dissections, perforations, acute vessel occlusion, and sometimes arrhythmias can happen. Uh, these are the limitations of IVAS. Uh, there is definitely additional time is required. Some uh, initial cost of procedure is required more. Availability of equipment equipment is not at every place. Learning curve of acquisition is there, and uh, tissue characterization is limited sometimes. And thrombus detection can be challenging in, with IVAS. Assessment of a strut level tissue coverage is not possible and uh, malar position is also limited and uh, longitudinal view, view has lower resolution as compared to OCD. So it is uh, uh, intracoronary imaging is essential in modern day practice along with FR. It is simple, relatively easily available and cheaper modality and learning curve is important but not very steep and it helps in uh, PCI planning as well as PCI optimization and we should always uh, target towards uh, IOS guided PCI rather than PCI with IOS. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for the excellent presentation. I think you covered almost everything in 15, 20 minutes on IVAS. Uh, any any other comments from other faculties? Uh, we are running closer to our evening session. With this. So any other comments? Mogandi, sir, you have any comments on this? No, no, it's an excellent presentation. We can go to, uh, with the next topic. Yeah, I think we are done with uh, Dr. Kasuri is not available here for his talk. Okay. And uh, thank you so much, everyone. So everybody, all the faculties for the past three, the three, three and a half hours uh, 
continuously we learned a lot and fellows would have got maximum benefit because hey, all the aspects of uh, intravascular imaging and physiology have been discussed in three three and a half hours and I thank all the faculties and all the chairpersons, moderators uh, for taking their time and contribute for the success of these three sessions. And uh, very nice fellows those we had. Thank you so much. I thank uh, Chris uh, for staying late from Brisbane and uh, for his excellent lecture also. Thank you so much, Chris, and thank you all of the faculties. Uh, it was a pleasure, AJ, and uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we hope uh, we'll see you again uh, in the evening session. It starts at 5.30 and a uh, lot of overseas faculties and excellent talks live in the box to presentations. I hope everyone will join the evening session and tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.